On Capitol Hill Tuesday, the House Government Operations Subcommittee on Legislation and National Security held an oversight hearing on the assessment of ballistic missile threats to the United States. Given the recent events in the Soviet Union and President Bush's address on Friday calling for cuts in nuclear arsenals. Coming up next, we bring you those proceedings and the testimony of a panel of witnesses that includes Bruce Blair of the Brookings Institution and Paul Zimmerman with George Washington University. They join representatives from the American Security Council Foundation, the Federation of American. Good morning. The Subcommittee on Legislation and National Security holds this oversight hearing on the assessment of the threat of ballistic missile attack on the United States. We examine this question as part of our continuing oversight of the Strategic Defense Initiative Organization. The question before us, of course, is where's the threat and what's the rush? This is the only hearing Congress has held on the threat the SDI program is supposed to counter. It is the first congressional hearing since the President's announced reductions in our nuclear forces. The President has made a remarkable policy shift. Uh, <clears throat> we, uh, weapons that were vital on Thursday were obsolete on Friday. Positions the administration has long denounced are now embraced. And we welcome the president's conversion, uh, but does it make the previous threat assessments suspect? Well, maybe it does. If the threat has diminished enough to stand down our alert nuclear forces, why do we still need the Strategic Defense Initiative, SDI? The SDI program does not, and in my view, cannot deal with the most likely post-Cold War nuclear threat to the United States, the threat of a tactical nuclear bomb stolen from the United States and Soviet stockpiles and driven, flown, or sailed into the country. And so, uh, it, in, in, in other words, the... Uh, the real threat to the country is not the uh, Red October of Tom Clancy, but maybe the Ian Fleming's Thunderball, in which the uh, fictional thriller had international criminals blackmailed uh, the country with two tactical nuclear bombs stolen from a NATO aircraft. Uh, we uh, may have a modern-day James Bond who can save the world, but the safer course would be to eliminate these obsolete weapons before they eliminate us. And the President has now taken the first important steps toward that goal. This demonstrates that there are credible military and arms controls alternatives to our previous nightmares. We do not have to spend the $120 billion that SDI, uh, SDI officials say are needed to implement their program. The expert panel assembled today, and we're grateful for their presence, represents the best national expertise that we have on these vital issues. And I'd like to uh, note that we have invited administration uh, witnesses to appear as well. And after reviewing uh, some of this testimony, I'd like to just uh, draw uh, a few preliminary conclusions. It seems to me, from what we uh, have in terms of the prepared statement before us, that the danger of an unauthorized or accidental launch of Soviet ballistic missiles is slight. It seems to me that the danger of a ballistic missile attack on the United States by a third world country is minuscule. It seems to me that the Threat estimates are inflated and are being slanted for political reasons. It seems to me that the, the President of the United States 
uh, has failed to apply the logic that he presented for his reductions across the board. And uh, in this time and period in which we're redirecting our national security efforts, uh, I want to go slow in making these, these kinds of decisions in the Congress. And I think the American people will need time uh, to examine these more carefully. We've taken bombers off alert. We've reduced tactical nuclear missiles from 7,000 to 5,000. We've canceled the uh, MX rail mobile system. But we still have uh, SDI, the B-2 uh, nuclear uh, uh, submarines known as Seawolf, and an $11 billion a year production of new warheads by the Department of Energy. And it seems to me that this hearing uh, with the witnesses that we have are indeed very important. I'd like now to turn to our senior member of government operations, my friend from New York, Mr. Frank Horton. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I want to commend you for calling these hearings. Four years ago, as you, uh, four days ago, uh, as you've already indicated, the President made the most sweeping and generous proposal in history of nuclear weapons announcing unilateral cuts the stand down of our strategic bomber force and the immediate deactivation of certain ICBMs even before start is approved. I certainly commend the President on his courageous stand and, um, and um, indicate that I think this is a, a real important step in the right direction. While we all applaud the President's new nuclear proposals, they pertain mostly to shorter range tactical systems and not longer range ICBMs that can still threaten the United States. And the subject of ballistic missile threats to the United States is, mo most timely, is a most timely subject considering the recent events in the Middle East and especially the Soviet Union. While the old Cold War fears of massive missive, uh, missile attacks from the Soviet Union are ebbing, there are now new concerns. For the more immediate future are the possible accidental or unauthorized attacks from the Soviet Union. During the recent coup attempt, their nuclear suitcase of what we call the football had to be rendered useless by military officials loyal to President Gorbachev for fear of unauthorized launches. Those loyal officials then had to take further steps to block potential launch transmissions. We have also learned that the coup leaders were apparently drinking quite heavily, in short, not a very reassuring scenario. Also disturbing are the recent stories about breakaway Soviet republics obtaining or retaining nuclear arsenals. One day we read that the Ukraine wants to be nuclear free, the next they might want to retain the weapons. Some are predicting civil war in the Soviet Union, with one side or another resorting to nuclear weapons. Again, not a very reassuring scenario. You don't have to be a Tom Clancy to envision some very frightening scenarios. Then there, then there is um, a recent pro a proliferation of uh, ballistic missile systems in the third world. Does anyone believe that Saddam Hussein would not have used ICBM if, if he had had them? While all third war systems are currently short range, I think we would be naive to believe that eventually they will not develop longer range capabilities. After all, there are still people alive today who remember the Wright brothers' first flight. In short, events tend to move pretty fast. Senators Nunn and Warren Warner have introduced legislation to build one anti-ballistic missile site to guard against such limited attacks. While the administration prefers their own global protection against limited strikes, or GPALS, the President has endorsed the proposal as a first step. Considering these recent events, both proposals now merit serious study and discussion. I therefore look forward to hearing from our experts on the panel on these uh, threats which are facing the United States. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, did anybody else want to? Uh, let me recognize uh, Ray Thornton, the gentleman from Arkansas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to first congratulate you for scheduling this hearing, which is even more timely than we could have imagined at the time that you uh, uh, introduced the concept, because indeed the world is changing. And we need new strategies for a changing world. We need to address the problems of 
national security, recognizing that our national security is dependent not only upon being the mightiest nation militarily, but also the strongest e economically, in order that we may enter the next century with the base upon which to maintain uh, the greatness that is America in the defense of human values, dignity, freedom, and responsibility. It is for that reason that I think it is very important that we look carefully at developing new strategies for a changing world, uh, look carefully at the idea of redeploying and redirecting our resources into a comprehensive plan for helping America to achieve those challenges. Many of the members of Congress, including the chairman of this committee, have been saying that we need to have now a Marshall Plan for America to redirect our resources into education, infrastructure, the problems of our cities, and the problems of our country in order that we may attain the goals of entering the next century, uh, as I outlined, the mightiest militarily, the strongest economically, and the greatest in terms of human dignity. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I appreciate your statement. And we now turn to the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. John Kyle, who additionally serves on the Armed Services Committee in the House. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to submit a, a statement for the record and just summarize a couple of points, if I could. Without objection. Um, and uh, I appreciate your mentioning the House Armed Services Committee has held a series of hearings on this, most recently a hearing last week. Um, Mr. Chairman, you uh, outlined, I think, two of the, uh, the, the general theories uh, that are being propounded these days about the President's announcement. Uh, one of them, basically, that we never really had a whole lot to worry about, and therefore the President should have acted sooner regarding the elimination of our offensive deterrent. The counter to that is, of course, that our strength is what forced the Soviets to uh, reform their system and had a lot to do with our success. And I think that that strength still does have a lot to do with our future success. I illustrate that by noting that before we decided to take action in the Persian Gulf a couple of weeks ago uh, to back up the uh, search by the United Nations uh, force to find nuclear weapons documents in Iraq, the first thing we did was to send batteries of Patriot missiles there. Why? Because we wanted to be able to defend against any scuds that Iraq might have. And that's illustrative of what is going to drive our military and foreign policy in the future. Anywhere the United States wants to conduct foreign policy and must be prepared to use force, we're going to first have to be able to defend against the ballistic missile threat. Today it's the short-range threat. Tomorrow it'll be the medium-range threat. And eventually it will be the long-range threat. And that's the justification for the Strategic Defense Initiative. I'm looking forward, Mr. Chairman, to the answers that these witnesses will have to the question you posed at the end of your, uh, your statement. And my conclusion from what I have read is that the Strategic Defense Initiative will be very important to this country in the next decade and beyond. Thank you. I uh, thank you for your observations. Uh, the chair notices that uh, Mr. Glenn English, our ranking member from Oklahoma, is with us. He chooses not to make an opening statement, but I, uh, I know that Chris Shays from Connecticut would like to say something, and I'd recognize him at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank you and our ranking member for holding these hearings and to say that, that I remember when Lech Walesa spoke to us in 1989, uh, he said, for you, the United States, World War II ended in 1945 and the Cold War began. For us, Poland, World War II ended in 1989. Obviously, there were major events that happened uh, just in the last few years. The Cold War has now, in fact, ended. Uh, the old world order is dead, and the new world order remains to be defined. I'm looking forward to hearing from our panelists. I, I, I have some assurance that we have experts on both sides of the issue, and that's most welcome. Um, I have uh, the concern that uh, we have to make a decision that will have impact 10 years from now. And we have to try to determine, our nation has to try to determine what will this new world order be and what will our needs be for this, this, this new order. So I'm looking forward to our hearings and I congratulate you for ha con conducting them. I thank you very much, Mr. Shays. Uh, Mr. Colin Peterson of Minnesota uh, is with us and we're prepared to begin. We have, of course, uh, Mr. Bruce Blair, uh, Mr. Uh, Peter Zimmerman, uh, Mr. Stephen Hildreth, excuse me for calling those out of order, Mr. Sven Kramer, uh, Mr. John Pike, and uh, uh, Dr. Payne, uh, who was added on at the uh, request of uh, 
our colleague, Mr. Kyle. Gentlemen, uh, before we begin our, your testimony, would you all raise your right hand and take the witness oath, please? Uh, do you solemnly swear that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Uh, let the uh, record indicate that all of the witnesses uh, answered in the affirmative, and we're prepared to begin. First of all, thank you for the written statements that you've prepared. Obviously, uh, we won't be able to have them in their entirety, uh, but we think that this is a uh, uh, important way to summarize, and I would like to merely indicate that Dr. Bruce Blair is a senior fellow in the Foreign Policy Studies program at Brookings, who's testified uh, before this subcommittee in 1985 on the command and control of nuclear forces. He's recognized as one of the nation's top authorities in this area and has authored numerous studies. Pleased to have him back. His expert includes practical experience. He was a launch officer in Minutemen silos while in the Air Force and is now working with a former Soviet launch officer who is incidentally in the audience today and has given testimony on the Hill relative to the improvements to both nations' control of nuclear weapons. We welcome you as our first witness this morning. Thank you, uh, Mr. Conyers. <clears throat> I have a very uh, brief opening statement. The argument that GPALS is needed to defend the United States against a small, accidental, or unauthorized launch of Soviet missiles does not rest on credible evidence. No one has advanced a plausible scenario that would result in such a launch. All the conclusion available to date, in fact, supports the opposite conclusion. Soviet safeguards are strict enough to prevent the accidental firing of a single missile, as well as the illicit firing of a group of land-based missiles or a boatload of submarine missiles. Now, I think we should keep an open mind about these dangers and that we should strengthen safeguards. But a heavy burden of proof falls on those who claim that the dangers warrant a massive investment in missile defenses. The evidence I'll present uh, briefly this morning is drawn from information collected uh, during research sponsored by Brookings and the Inter International Foundation. The support of these organizations has facilitated discussions of today's topics with Soviet experts, including many who have served in combat roles in the strategic rocket and ballistic missile submarine forces. Some of them provided detailed knowledge of procedures and technical devices used to prevent unauthorized launches of Soviet ballistic missiles. I'm accompanied here, as the chairman noted, uh, today by Gennady Pavlov. Yevgeny Velikov, who's chairman of the International Foundation and President Gorbachev's science advisor, recommended Gennady to me personally as a real expert in this area and conversations with him over the past several months have deeply enriched my understanding of their system. My views, however, should not be ascribed to him or to the above-mentioned organizations. We should begin by briefly sketching the alleged threat driving the GPALS program. As uh, you would you it, define GPALS uh, so uh, that we'll all be on the same footing? Global Protection Against Limited Strikes, which is a scaled-down version of the original vision of SDI. Thank you. For an accidental launch, the threat consists of a single SS-18 missile carrying 10 warheads or a single SSN-20 sea-based missile carrying 10 warheads. For an unauthorized launch, the threat consists of a group of 10 SS-18 missiles for a total of 100 warheads or a boatload of Typhoon-class SSN-20 missiles carrying a, a total of 200 warheads. So the worst case threat for GPALS is either a 100 warhead ICBM attack or a 200 warhead SSBN or submarine attack. And I'll evaluate the plausibility of each beginning with the ICBM threat. This scenario of unauthorized ICBM attack assumes unauthorized launch of 10 missiles by the two-man combat crew that normally controls them. 
There are several safeguards that stand in the way of such an act, beginning with the fact that the crews don't have access to the equipment that directly controls the missile launchers under normal circumstances. To gain such access, the crews must first receive a special order called a preliminary command, which is jointly issued by the Chief of the General Staff and the Sink of the Strategic Rocket Forces as part of preparations for a deliberate Soviet strike. If this order isn't received, the crews are physically unable to operate the launch equipment that directly controls the missiles. Second, the crews must receive additional codes that in effect physically unblock their grouping of missiles. These unblocking codes, together with launch authorization codes, remain in the custody, custody of the highest military command and, uh, until a decision to employ nuclear weapons has been made by the President, the Minister of Defense, and the Chief of the General Staff. Once a deliberate decision to employ Soviet weapons has been made, the Chief of the General Staff and the Commander-in-Chief of the Strategic Rocket Forces form a message jointly that contains the requisite codes and transmits them down the chain of command to the crews. Unless and until this order, which is in Soviet parlance known as a direct command, is conveyed, the crews are physically incapable of firing any of the ten missiles in their group. In the SS-18 force, this direct command allows for an individual missile or for all ten missiles in any given group to be unlocked and launched. The codes must be correctly inserted within three attempts within an allowable time span of several seconds between each try or else the crews are locked out and unable to perform the launch sequence. After a certain span of time has expired, the blocking system is automatically reactivated. Other features of the Soviet ICBM control system designed to strengthen safeguards, and these are unique to the Soviet system, include a capability for higher command posts to monitor and, if necessary, override by technical means the actions taken by crews at the bottom. The missile launchers that have the, the missiles in them automatically report their status to high-level command po posts, which can take steps to neutralize the low-level rocket complexes. For example, the high, uh, higher centers can isolate the rocket complexes by remotely switching off the latter's communications. Now, the Soviet uh, silo-based ICBM force, particularly the modern forces like the SS-18s, against which GPALS is being sized, is under the strictest regime of technical safeguards from top to the bottom of the chain of command. And other ballistic missile forces do compare unfavorably with silo-based ICBMs in one respect or another. But the safeguards regime must still be considered strict for them as well. In the SSBN force, the submarine force, for example, a launch command, which I mentioned earlier is referred to as a direct command, comes as a signals package sent jointly by the chief of the general staff and the commander in chief of the Navy. This package is broken down into se several parcels for verification by personnel and by electronic equipment on the submarine. The political officer, or what used to be the political officer, um, since replaced, since political activities have been banned from the Soviet Armed Services, the, the political officer or his new replacement, the executive officer and the captain verify codes manually and ensure also that the order was transmitted over the proper frequency, which, in, which the general staff periodically changes a launch order must come over a particular frequency at any given time, or it's considered invalid. The key verification, though, the crucial one, involves the insertion of certain codes into elect an electronic device called the decoding and interlocking system. If the codes fail to validate, and remember these are codes that are part of the package sent from higher authority, this electronic system will not electronically activate the submarine's fire control and missile control systems, and the crew is deprived of the physical capability to launch its missiles. In addition, once the fire control system is turned on after this validation process, the captain must insert 
uh, a special key into the fire control system as well as a special code before it will permit, that is before the con fire control system will permit a launch. That latter code evidently comes from higher authority. I might add parenthetically that all these arrangements contrast with U.S. SS SSBNs which possess within the, the vessel itself the physical capacity to launch missiles without any external input. The Soviet nuclear forces that pose the greatest danger of unauthorized use are not the long-range missiles, but rather the short-range tactical weapons. Safeguarding these weapons, and particularly the warheads for them, is the responsibility of special troops assigned to the general staff. These troops guard the warheads at the storage depots. They transport them, they unlock them, and mate them to their delivery means only immediately prior to the time of their authorized use. This procedure involves either unlocking the containers which hold the warheads, which would be the case, for example, for artillery shells, or inserting unlock codes into the warhead itself, depending on the type of weapon. The regular military chain of command controls the delivery vehicles, which also usually are protected by devices that need to be unlocked using codes from higher authority. For example, an artillery gun have, has a, co a coding device built into it that requires certain codes to be inserted before it will fire an artillery shell, which itself had to have been uh, released through the general staff. The least effective safeguards are evidently found at sea. <clears throat> the sea-based tactical weapons, of course, are, uh, when deployed at sea, mated to their means of delivery, and the primary a safeguard for these weapons leaves something to be desired at times. Nuclear-tipped torpedoes, for example, uh, are protected solely by an ignition device kept in the captain's quarters. This is the only physical part of the weapon needed to, f needed to fire the nu nuclear-tipped torpedo, and the vessel is autonomous in this respect. Since GPALS deals with ballistic missiles only, it slides past these more plausible threats of loss of control over tactical weapons. We should worry far more about the roughly 5,000 tactical weapons located outside the Russian Republic, mostly in the independence-minded republics of the Ukraine and Belarusia. In an emergency, these weapons could be relocated back inside Russia in a matter of weeks. Now, I don't mean to suggest that the only serious dangers exist at the tactical level. To the contrary, in my judgment, the greatest risk actually lies at the strategic level. But this risk is not one of accidental or unauthorized la launch due to the actions at the bottom of the chain of the command. Instead, the risk consists of misguided decisions taken by the top leaders which would as likely produce a massive strike as a very limited one. GPALs would offer no protection against irrational or incompetent Soviet leadership of the sort evident during the abortive coup last August. Nor would it protect against an inadvertent launch triggered by false alarms during a crisis. The greatest contemporary danger of inadvertent nuclear war in my estimation, stems from the high combat readiness of strategic forces, coupled with reliance on both sides on the option of launch on warning. Add incompetent leadership to the equation, and the danger is significant indeed. If a false warning of Western attack had suddenly occurred at the height of the coup, the risk of inadvertent war might have been significant. I think we should rejoice in the fact that the West and the Bush administration reacted very calmly to developments during the coup and that the situation was not aggravated by malfunctions in early warning systems. Nevertheless, these are the major sources of inadvertent war and obviously GPALS does nothing to, al to alleviate them. Lastly, it's important to recognize that the breakaway Repub republics could not gain effective launch control over strategic missiles based on their territory. Although they may seek to acquire veto rights over their use, any attempt to gain a unilateral launch capability 
would leave the central government no choice but to disable the launch system and begin relocating the weapons to Russian soil. In an emergency, that evacuation, talking about of strategic nuclear forces, the ICBMs in Kazakhstan and the Ukraine and Belarusia, in an emergency, that evacuation could be accomplished in about three months, after which Russia would become the sole repository of strategic forces. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Blair, for opening this up. We probably need to uh, introduce uh, more summary, summarizing into our statements so that we can get through. Uh, we now welcome uh, from the Congressional Research Service, Mr. Stephen Hildreth, a specialist in national defense with foreign affairs and national defense division of the Congressional Research Service. At CRS, Mr. Hildreth specializes in U.S. and Soviet strategic nuclear offensive and defensive programs, particularly ballistic missile defense and strategic arms control. We welcome you to the hearing, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's an honor to appear this morning uh, before your uh, subcommittee. As a specialist... Pull your mic just a little bit closer, please. As a specialist in uh, national defense at the, uh, at the Congressional Research Service, I track these issues as uh, you've described. And I've also in the past have published some books that deal with the role of advanced weapons in developing countries. Um, I was invited to testify today on current and prospective missile threats arising from third countries, uh, those, non -Soviet con those, no those that are non-Soviet, um, to the United States and its interests overseas and its allies and uh, U.S. forces. Um, and to discuss ballistic missile defenses and BMD as an option to responding to those threats. My purpose is, uh, I need to emphasize, is not to advocate any policy position with respect to BMD deployment, but rather systematically to delineate uh, potential missile threats and responses. My statement builds on an unclassified uh, CRS report written by my colleague uh, Amy Wolf and myself last spring. And without objection, I'd like that report and uh, this statement uh, put into the record. Without objection, uh, they'll both be added. And I might uh, say that all of the statements prepared will be incorporated in their entirety into the record. Okay. My statement on threat assessment reflects current thinking among specialists who work in this area. Uh, but obviously, unforeseen events could change the perspective several years from now. Uh, the statement is drawn from unclassified sources, including extensive discussions with my CRS colleagues. In 1989, the director of the CIA testified that by the year 2000, at least 15 developing countries will be producing their own ballistic missiles. Uh, George, President Bush stated this past Friday night that some 15 nations now have ballistic missiles, and that number could grow to 20 in less than a decade. Such statements often give rise to alarm and concern about threats to U.S. national security and to possible attacks on the U.S. homeland. When the CIA or others project that a certain number of countries will have missiles in the future, it doesn't necessarily mean that those missiles will have the range needed to reach the United States, nor does it necessarily mean that those countries will see any reason to threaten U.S. interests. These factors are important to the current debate over missile defenses. Let me talk for a few minutes about real versus perceived threats. Why, for example, do we worry about Libya attacking us with ballistic missiles, but not Japan? Or for that matter, why do we not fear attack from British or French strategic nuclear forces? The answer is that the case for real or prospective threats must be built on more than one factor. It's useful, therefore, to separate perceived threats from real or prospective threats. In Libya's case, there is evidence of intent sufficient for concern. Colonel Gaddafi says that if he had a long-range missile that could reach New York, he would use it. But the fact is that Qaddafi does not have such a missile, nor it is likely that he could build an ICBM in the next 10 to 15 years capable of reaching the United States, nor is it likely he could acquire such a missile from China or the Soviet Union. In other words, although Libya has announced will, it lacks genuine or plausible capability. Britain and France, on the other hand, have clear capability, but absolutely no interest in attacking the United States. Similarly, Japan could probably acquire both an ICBM, and a nuclear warhead capability in a very short order, period of time, but it too has no interest in doing so. Perhaps too often we seem to focus primarily on will while downplaying uh, real or prospective capability and sometimes ignoring a number of other qualifying factors as well. Let me just say a couple things here uh, to summarize the, the, uh, the rest of this section. 
it's important to, to note that, that threat uh, is a signaled willingness to use military force in order to compel or, or deter someone into doing something. Um, and having a credible capability serves to verify that that signaled willingness. Otherwise, it's bluster. And if you don't have capability, um, you can threaten all you want. There's a very busy chart that I have included in this, uh, in this uh, statement. And let me just say a couple things about it and then summarize it. Um, the chart is broken up. It, it, what it does, it's the, the table separates um, foreign missile types in terms of range, short, medium, and long range, because the United States, its allies, and its forces overseas face different types of missile threats. It's an important point because different missile threats do not create the same risks. And as one choice among many alternative policy choices, different BMD systems can be used to counter different types of current and prospective ballistic missile threats. Table 1 further differentiates among warhead capabilities, chemical, conventional, nuclear. And finally, the summary table details current prospective threats based on a number of the factors, the number of issues involved in doing threat assessment that I referred to in this section, including missile and warhead capabilities. And let me summarize the table. Like I said, it's very busy. Table 1 suggests, uh, first of all, that short and medium range missile threats from third countries, again non-Soviet, to the United States proper do not now exist and the only conceivable short or medium range missile threat to the United States over the next 10 to 15 years would be from Cuba and only under, and I need to emphasize, and only under a set of highly questionable yet imaginable assumptions and that is that a third country such as North Korea transfers or exports short range missiles to Cuba, that regimes in both countries survive long enough for that to happen and that regimes in both countries want that to happen. Second point, the only long-range ballistic missile threat from a third country to the United States today is from China, from the, P from the PRC, and it has fewer than 10 such missiles. No new additional ICBM threat from third countries to the United States is foreseen over the next 10 years or so. Let me talk about threats to U.S. interests overseas now. Short-range missiles, short missiles could, thir could currently threaten U.S. interests in southern Europe, the Middle East and East Asia. This is likely to remain the same into the future. Medium range missiles from the PRC Saudi and Saudi Arabia could potentially threaten U.S. interests throughout the Far East, the Middle East, I forgot to put it in here, and Europe. This potential threat, based largely on capability, is not likely to change into the future. And, long, and finally, in long range missiles from the PRC from China could continue to threaten U.S. interests throughout Asia. This too is not likely to change. Let me say a couple things and uh, try to wrap this up here in a, few, in a minute or so. Let me make a couple observations uh, regarding missile threats and missile defenses. Um, and I draw these from the, the, the CRS report that we referred to earlier. First, the United States, its allies, and its forces overseas face different types of ballistic missile threats. These threats range from single warhead short-range missiles armed with conventional warheads that might attack U.S. forces or allies engaged in a regional conflict to multiple warhead ICBMs armed with nuclear warheads that might attack the United States, and in this case only two countries, the Soviet Union and uh, to a lesser, to a very small degree, the, the China. Second point, the different types of ballistic missile threats do not create the same risks for the United States, its allies, or its forces overseas. Some ballistic missiles, such as those delivering conventional weapons during a regional conflict, would be far less destructive than other missiles such as those delivering nuclear warheads in an all-out Soviet attack. However, a regionally constrained conflict with attacks by conventionally armed ballistic missiles now appears more likely to materialize than any Soviet, nu than US, any Soviet, US Soviet conflict with nuclear weapons. And finally, different types of BMD systems can be used to counter different types of ballistic missile threats. Although there can be similarities between BMD concepts, particularly with respect to the technologies they would employ, they can be separated into distinct programs with distinct missions, objectives, and costs. And it may be possible to design one BMD system that could counter most or all of the threats, but it may, may not be necessary to be so comprehensive. And there's a table that I have on the couple pages later that summarizes some of this, these threats and possible responses to them as far as the United States is concerned. But ultimately, the choice among alternative BMD systems may reflect a balancing of costs and benefits and may include weighing real versus perceived threats. My final comments and then I'll conclude. Um, 
and this has to do with alternatives to ballistic missile defenses. The availability of time before many ballistic missile threats become real provides an opportunity to explore alternatives to counter ballistic missiles without the deployment of ballistic missile defenses. Many of the ballistic missile threats facing the United States, its allies, and its interests overseas um, will not materialize for some time. During that time, the United States may pursue other military, political, economic, and arms control measures that could either counter the threats or slow their development. And this approach seems to be part of what President Bush was talking about this last Friday night. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stephen Hildreth. We appreciate that very much. Our next panelist, Dr. Peter Zimmerman, is a nuclear physicist with long experience in arms control and space technology. He is a visiting senior fellow for arms control and verification at the Center for Strategic and International Studies and is a research professor of engineering and applied science at George Washington University. We welcome you before the subcommittee this morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is uh, truly an honor and privilege to be uh, invited to testify before this committee and to contribute some of my thoughts on the dimensions of the threat to the United States from the proliferation of ballistic missiles. Thank you very much for affording me the opportunity. Today, October the 1st, 1991, the continental United States is vulnerable to nuclear-armed ballistic missiles launched by the Soviet Union, China, France, and the United Kingdom. In five years, the United States will be vulnerable to nuclear-armed ballistic missile attacks from exactly the same nations. Although it's true that India and Israel could have nuclear-armed intercontinental missiles by the turn of the century, attacks from France, the United Kingdom, and Israel are inconceivable. Given changing events, the same is probably true of the Soviet Union and the other actual and potential nuclear powers. China's eight ICBMs are targeted at Russia. Nevertheless, the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction and the means to deliver them, even if not to our shores, remains one of our most serious problems. As the U.S.-Soviet confrontation fades away, we must seek not a new world order, but an orderly new world. President Bush's statement of last Friday is a step on the road to great power de-emphasis of nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles and cannot help but be an example to those who still see such weapons as essential to their security. But let me be specific to ballistic missiles and their threat to the United States. The technology for short-range rockets is readily available. The blueprints of V2s and Jupiter Intermediate Range ballistic missiles can be found at the Smithsonian Archives where they will sell you the entire Jupiter technology 500 and some odd reels of microfilm at $11 a reel. They will deliver it to the gate of the facility. What you do with it then is up to you. Seen in this light, one must ask why only three countries have produced intercontinental ballistic missiles when so many nations have built shorter range rockets. And indeed, why so few have stretched the, uh, their capabilities from the 500 or 1,000 kilometer range to the 3,000 kilometer range. The difficulty of building successful missiles increases rapidly, one might almost say exponentially, with the size and range of the rocket, and very few nations can justify the cost. In my prepared statement, I've given many examples, but they boil down to this. In going from 300 kilometer, 200 mile range missiles to ones with an intercontinental range, the designer and builder encounter engineering and scientific problems which are not merely different in quantity, but also in quality, requiring a new set of solutions and technologies. It takes much time, a lot of money, and many tests to acquire a reliable ICBM capability. I do not expect any new entries in the ICBM club through the rest of this century. Am I positive that there will be no new members? No. Technological and military surprises happen, even if we cannot fathom the logic of the proliferators. Further, one can't discount the possibility that a third world nation could build a submarine capable of launching either ballistic or cruise missiles. James lists at least 20 countries which have built one or more subs in their own shipyard. These include 
both Koreas, Brazil, Argentina, India, and Yugoslavia, some of which are clearly potential nuclear powers. However, building a missile submarine weapon system will take many years, providing time for strategic warning and for reaction by the United States. In a techno-thriller, the commanding officer of a Typhoon-class Soviet SSBN might drive his ship into the Gulf of Mexico and unload all 20 missile tubes against the United States, without, of course, authorization from the Soviet center. This is the threat which drives the size of the GPALS, Global Protection Against Limited Strikes, system. And it is not credible to me. I suspect it's not credible to uh, my co-panelist, Bruce Blair, who is, after all, the world's expert on the subject. After his recent meeting with Soviet President Gorbachev, Senator Nunn also appeared satisfied that Soviet procedures were more than reasonably secure. Building on something Bruce said, uh, one might note that it's perhaps more reasonable for the Soviets to worry about a mad American captain since our submarines do not use permiss permissive action links which physically block the launch of our missiles. Ballistic missiles could also be launched from almost any surface ship big enough to carry them, in principle. In practice, I ask you to imagine the difficulties of firing a rocket from a pitching deck and doing it without having rehearsed it. A ship could, of course, be especially adapted to the missile role, but it is likely to be easily identified under construction and at sea. If defense against surface raiders with nuclear missiles or third world missile submarines is considered necessary, let me propose that the funds would be better invested in intelligence collection assets which could provide clear warning that a country was developing and testing such missiles. Good intelligence is the cheapest force multiplier. One problem which has crept up is that the START Treaty does not mandate the destruction of missiles withdrawn from service. And thus, there could be a large stock of, in quotes, space launchers, which are really ICBMs, and which could be for sale on the open market. However, that situation could be mitigated by agreement to limit the rate of delivery of space launchers so that customers never have more than one rocket, and by insisting upon inspections and launchers, inspections of launchers and payloads under the jurisdiction of what I have called a missile non-proliferation treaty. Of course, a terrorist nation could use the diplomatic pouch or commercial shipment to export nuclear weapons to our cities our freedom of action would be at least as constrained by smuggled weapons as it would be by a small missile force. Back in the 40s, J. Robert Oppenheimer was asked what tools he would want in order to uh, protect against, to detect smuggled nuclear weapons. He responded before a congressional committee, a crowbar and a screwdriver. And I would submit that for smuggled threats, the situation has not changed very much. There is, I am convinced, little need for a massive system to, guide, to, to guard the United States against the accidental or unauthorized launch of a Soviet missile or an intentional launch of a third world ballistic missile. Some have suggested that a multi-site deployment of ABM interceptors is necessary in case we uh, wake up one morning to find out that Colonel Gaddafi has acquired a nuclear armed ICBM. We are likely to be so surprised only if we have neglected our intelligence establishment or have allowed its analyses to be corrupted. Since the spread of guided missiles endangers many of our friends, it threatens us indirectly. I advocate strongly that we seek new diplomatic and military paths to prevent or slow the proliferation of both ballistic and cruise missiles. Furthermore, we should encourage the nations of the world to join with us in the negotiation of a demand-side missile non-proliferation treaty. It would be better to eliminate the risk at its inception than to wait until the threat is mature. The danger to the United States posed by the kind of short-range ballistic missiles which will be developed in the next decade or so has been vastly exaggerated and has been exaggerated by those with programs such as SDI or GPALS to sell. 
I could endorse a single-site defense against very small ballistic missile strikes as being comforting and not destabilizing, so long as it were developed within both the letter and spirit of the ABM Treaty. But that, I remind you, is not what has been proposed. Let me conclude by saying that I am convinced, Mr. Chairman, that there are no ballistic missile threats which justify building the various grandiose systems, land and space-based, to defend against limited, accidental, unauthorized, and above all, implausible attacks. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm pleased now to call on Mr. Sven Kramer, who uh, from 1981 through 1987 uh, was the director of uh, arms control in the National Security Council. Uh, he has been with the National Security Council for 16 years and is currently the director of policy and research at the American Security Council Foundation. Mr. Kramer, we welcome you to these proceedings. Mr. Chairman and members, I'm very honored that I can join you as you address a life or death issue of future missile threats and required defenses. It's your obligation under the Constitution to provide for the common defense, and here's a topic that is right on that target. I provided you an extensive statement, and I am pleased that you will accept all of our longer statements. Today I will summarize some of the main points. I do believe that your judgments on missile threats and missile defenses directly affect the lives of all Americans and our global security. Every American, whether civilian or military, whether within our shores or overseas, and also it affects the entire globe. We have to look beyond the year 2000 in our discussions today. We have to look at responses for the remainder of the decade, the decade to the threats, but also beyond that time so we can plan effectively for the future safety of our people and the globe because history and threats won't stop nine years from now, and nor should our people's lives. We also have to agree that non-strategic and less than highly accurate missiles may also matter. We can't focus just on threats involving missiles with intercontinental ranges and high accuracy. There have often been surprising innovations in improving existing systems, and in the future we may again be surprised, notwithstanding expert predictions, as we have been now in Iraq. It's also really irrelevant to a threatened person whether he lives in the continental United States or abroad or that they are the target of an intercontinental or a shorter range missile. As for high accuracy, is blackmail or attack for missiles really to be judged less of a threat to its victims if it can just crudely destroy a city rather than exactly knock out a military silo or ship or post or a precise target? Let's also acknowledge here now that there can be deadly threats to the continental United States, not to mention Alaska, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico, from non-strategic distances in relatively close in sea and land areas. And when we consider American citizens and interests and allies about beyond our shores, we have to look to the n dangers of local missile wars or attacks escalating and bringing us in directly. That's why we have to worry about the regional threats. Then we need to understand the proliferation and violations problem. Secretary Cheney has said within the last few months that by the year 2000 it is estimated that at least 15 developing nations will have the ability to build ballistic missiles, eight of which either have or are near to acquiring nuclear capabilities, 30 countries will have chemical weapons, and 10 will be able to deploy biological weapons as well. And so far, arms control agreements have proved ineffective in controlling this kind of a spread. And we were surprised by the extent of Mr. Saddam Hussein's missile, nuclear, and chemical program activity and how it had been uh, kept covert. We must not gamble our children's lives on assurances that we will have missile peace in our time. As for the Soviet Union, it is very unstable. The American people and we and you should, I believe, not gamble millions of lives on current hopes for stability in a fracturing Soviet Union or in what or who comes in its place. There are thousands of missiles and 30,000 nuclear weapons in that crumbling empire. 12 to 14,000 of them are strategic. Some of these may fall into erratic or aggressive hands, as during the coup attempt, when codes were taken and when, for example, 
the Soviet submarine and Soviet Pacific fleets, according to Colonel <coughs> Oxness of the Red Army, took different sides. And he said that there might have been a danger right then and there of those two fleets using those nuclear weapons against each other for blackmail. Uh, just within the last 10 days, uh, Mr. Gorbachev has said that there are attempts to create fractures and attempts to block the ongoing processes and that after overcoming the shock of defeat, they, the coup plotters, are now trying to find new ways of picking up the threads and repeating their attempts. Mr. Shepard Nazi and Mr. Yeltsin have made similar warnings. We can have no assurances in the long run until and unless full democracy is established in the Soviet Union that such coup attempts and future aggressive uh, personnel people may not be in, at the control of nuclear weapons. We also ought to acknowledge as President Bush reported to the Congress in detail on February 15th, that the Soviet Union has a trail of broken treaties in the strategic, chemical, biological, and nuclear testing areas. It is currently in violation or circumvention of three agreements recently signed by Mr. Gorbachev himself, the Intermediate Nuclear Force Treaty, the Conventional Forces in Europe Treaty, and the Ballistic Missile Launch Notification Agreement. This is not confidence inspiring. We have to work with the new democratic leaders in the Soviet Union to put a stop to this. Uh, one of those treaties that is broken is the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. Uh, Mr. F uh, Edward Charvin Nazi acknowledged that in 1989, that it had been broken in 1983 by construction of the Krasnoyarsk radar. And President Bush in his February 15th report indicates there are five other areas of uh, compliance concern in terms of Soviet ABM activity. This treaty is obsolete and I believe it's deadly. The popular illusion that the ABM Treaty helps secure any stability has tragic consequences. This is worse than the Emperor's new clothes and worse than a broken Humpty Dumpty of a contract which can't be put together again. I believe it's unsafe, obsolete, and destabilizing in its premises, and it's ethically unsound. As recently proven by Saddam Hussein and others in its reliance on the mad suicidal theory of mutual assured destruction. It also is wrong in assuming the infeasibility of effective strategic defenses when technology is now proving otherwise. START also won't help us sufficiently, the Strategic Arms Reduction Agreement, although if improved it could, because there's no, uh, there's no effective guarantee right now that we will get down to such low levels of nuclear weapons as to uh, really eliminate the threat for the foreseeable future. Uh, I would myself suggest that the President propose to the Soviets in START that we eliminate, that they eliminate the 300 heavy missiles and the 300 mobile missiles that they have as a beginning. We have zero missiles of that type. That would achieve some parity. But in any case, I believe that deployed defenses are uh, a better guarantee or a comparable guarantee for start. You cannot have start reductions without the insurance policy of strategic defense, and at the same time, strategic defense cannot be truly effective unless you put a ceiling effectively verifiable on uh, offensive systems. You need deployed defenses when deterrence break down, breaks down and when attacks are launched. And the volatilities of history and the Saddam Husseins of the future will likely severely test us and our children. The missile, nuclear, chemical, and biological genies out of the bottle and men are not angels. I hope that in the face of a future missile blackmail or attack we won't have to say I gambled against SDI, this cost countless lives, I was dead wrong, I'm sorry. In this respect, and I don't mean to be frivolous, but SDI is never having to say you are sorry. We should have it. And I appeal to your informed consciences. Now, I urge you to support a priority national effort to meet the threats, take advantage of our technological gains, and push now for the acceleration of anti-missile defenses. We could start with ground-based, a modest ground-based effort in the United States, and a deployable theater defense option as a first step. That's a position inherent in the Missile Defense Act recently passed by the United States Senate. But this act makes further steps reliant on the ABM treaty constraints as agreed or modified by the Soviet Union. And ground space sites can only handle limited threat directions and can protect only relatively limited areas against particular threats. That's whether it's one initial site as in the Senate legislation or even the two sites that I believe to be permitted 
Now, by the 1989 summit statement, which pled the United States and the Soviet Union to comply with the ABM Treaty, quote, as signed in 1972. And of course, in 1972, there were two sites permitted. The Protocol of 74 hadn't been passed. So I do believe we're legally entitled to two sites. But one or two ground-based U.S. sites cannot really handle the threats from the sea or from the south, and they can't handle regional threats abroad. And at the same time, I believe the environmental impact of ground-based systems would be quite considerable. And also, we have the problem of essentially shooting down warheads over our country rather than in the boost phase or in mid-course. And therefore, space-based systems become of decisive importance to the United States. And I think that should be the global, that should be our focus. These are the most effective. They're highly promising. They're relatively inexpensive, like brilliant pebbles. And I think in this respect, the delay of the Congress and the administration in stepping up to the deployment of active defenses, not just sensors, is harmful. And I believe it would be helpful and important that the current three to one proportion of investment in ground-based and space-based defenses be reversed and that the treaty constraints be lifted. And I also would hope that the Brilliant Pebbles program should be revised. I think that that's what the Gulf War teaches us and also what the post-coup period in the Soviet Union may help us with. Because I do believe that the new Soviet leaders in the Soviet Union may also see it in their interest to have such defenses deployed. They'll say no initially. They may just want to do it on the ground. But I think they're moving in that direction. And the criticality of brilliant pebbles in being able to hit not only strategic threats, but also the theater missiles that go above 300 kilometers in range and about, above about 60 or 70 miles in altitude uh, is great. Some say that there may be potential against cruise missiles. I urge that we work all out with the democratically elected leaders of the Soviet Union, like Boris Yeltsin to seize this unprecedented but perhaps fragile and fleeting historic opportunity to help consolidate their democratic revolution, democratize and demilitarize their society, and drastically reduce their arms. And I believe a vital complement to that effort is the new leader's understanding that, uh, with the United States on deployment of strategic defenses. And that's the vision I would encourage you to take, and I thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Mr. Kramer. <coughs> We're we want the comments of Mr. Pike and Dr. Payne, of course, but we're, we're rushing against the clock at this point. Uh, Mr. John Pike uh, has authored over 130 studies and articles on space and national security. He serves as director of the Space Policy Project at the Federation of American Scientists, where he has coordinated research, analysis, and advocacy on military and civilian space policy. We welcome you to these hearings and the work that you did in putting your paper together. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to appear here today, and I'd also like to thank the staff members of FAS who helped prepare uh, our testimony this morning. In his dramatic announcement placing much of America's nuclear arsenal on a lowered state of readiness, President Bush finally acknowledged that the Soviet threat was not what it had cra been cracked up to be. But the continued pursuit of Star Wars is based on a chicken little approach to the new threats we face today. The system will undoubtedly cost far more than the current projections of $40 billion, probably over $100 billion. The system's computing and software requirements remain undiminished, and the recent problems with the telephone system remind us of the unpredictable behavior of such large and complex systems. And deployment of SDI will spell the end of the ABM Treaty and imperil progress on other arms control negotiations as well. These concerns would be of uh, less significance if there were a compelling reason for deploying SDI, but there is not. The exaggerated claims made for the threats that Star Wars is supposed to counter are simply the latest in a long series of inflated threats that have been made in a, an abiding feature of the anti-missile debate for the past three decades. In the early 1960s, fears arose that over two dozen countries would have nuclear weapons by the 1970s. But currently, only India, Israel, South Africa, and Pakistan are suspected to have active nuclear weapons programs. The Sentinel ABM system was justified in 1969 by the claim that was made that Red China is expected to test an ICBM within 18 months and to have 18 of them operational by 1975. But currently, the Chinese have only uh, about 10 CSS-4 ICBMs, which were first tested in 1980. 
uh, eight years after the supposed prediction. The Nixon administration's call for deployment of the Safeguard ABM uh, subsequently was based on the threat supposedly posed by the new triple ward head Soviet SS-9 ICBM, which was to asserted to have a capability for multiple independently targeted warheads by 1972. But the SS-9 warheads turned out not to be independently guided and not accurate enough uh, for a first strike capability. Now, in 1977, former Chief of uh, Air Force Intelligence George Keegan charged that the Soviets had achieved breakthroughs in particle beam weapons that could lead to prototype testing in 1978 and deployment of a fully operational system by 1980. And in 1982, Director of Defense uh, Research and Ender Engineering Richard DeLauer claimed that the Soviets could launch a space-based laser weapon, in his words, as early as 1983 to 1988. In late 1986, Robert Gates claimed that, quote, we expect the Soviets to test the feasibility of ground-based lasers for defense against ballistic missiles by the late 1980s, and they could begin testing components for large-scale deployment uh, system in the 1990s. Of course, needless to say, none of these dire predictions, uh, which have formed the basis for the SDI program over the last eight years, have come to pass. Now, of the 15 to 25 countries that may have ballistic missiles by the year 2000, only four, Iraq, Iran, Libya, and North Korea, have either the technical or economic resources to develop or acquire longer-range missiles than those such as the Scud. These countries could be closely monitored for indications of future missile developments, giving the United States more than adequate time to respond. Now, Representative Les Aspen has recently suggested that SDI might be needed to counter what he called non-deterrable threats, such as Saddam Hussein. But deterrence worked. General Ben Nunn, commander of the Israeli Air Force, concluded that, quote, the fact that he didn't launch chemical weapons against us was only because he feared our retaliatory response. Now, some people have recently been concerned about the prospect that some of the Soviet coup leaders were drunk, uh, a, strain, a case of... Uh, life imitating art. We all remember the scene in Dr. Strangelove where the president calls uh, Premier Kissoff on the hotline and the Soviet ambassador warns him, be careful, Mr. President, I think he's drunk. Of course, one should also recall that uh, Prime Minister Churchill provided uh, admirable leadership uh, for the British Empire during World War II under similar circumstances. <laughs> Uh, and perhaps the answer to this problem is simply to put a breathalyzer on uh, the Soviet and American footballs to ensure the sobriety of the leadership before they launch an attack. Missiles launched by mechanical accident are not a real problem. The Strategic Air Command uh, notes that, quote, there's absolutely no way that a Minuteman III could be accidentally launched. And in our review of actual missile accidents, we were able to find none that remotely corresponded to the conditions under which an armed nuclear missile would be launched due to mechanical failure. And no plausible scenario has been painted that would explain why loose Soviet nukes would be aimed at the United States. Why, for example, would anyone fighting to achieve Armenian independence launch nuclear weapons at the U.S. and risk turning their territory into a sea of radioactive glass? General Colin Powell has testified, quote, we have a pretty good handle on how the Soviets managed to control their nuclear weapons, and I think they have very good control over their systems. In conclusion, the prospects that an anti-missile shield might be needed in this century are so remote that there is no reason other than political expediency for proceeding now with deployment of such a system. None of the threats advanced by the Chicken Littles and Darth Vaders justifying spending billions of dollars in tearing up the ABM treaty. Star Wars is a system that won't work in search of a threat that doesn't exist. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and I, I did want to uh, appreciate uh, your summary of the global protection against limited strikes that had been introduced uh, this January into our discussion of SDI that was included in your fuller statement. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Keith Payne is the president and director of research of the National Institute of Public Policy and of course has written extensively on arms control issues and United States defense policy. He's been a distinguished consultant to the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy and the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency, and we welcome you today as our final witness, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a privilege to be before you today. I would like to summarize my full statement briefly, and in addition to my complete statement, I would like to submit for the record a recent published article on this subject that I have authored. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. 
The Gulf War demonstrated to millions of Americans the terrible direct threat to civilians from even primitive, inaccurate, and unreliable missiles that might carry chemical warheads. In addition to that direct threat, unless countered, proliferation will impose significant constraints on future U.S. military and foreign policy options. It's not difficult to see the debilitating effect that vulnerability to third-party missiles will have on the U.S. capability to establish an allied coalition in response to aggression. A ballistic missile threat to U.S. and allied cities could paralyze U.S. power projection. What U.S. president would be willing to run the risk of putting American cities under the same type of threat that confronted Tel Aviv and Riyadh during the Gulf War before the arrival of Patriot? The capability of third parties to deter U.S. and allied power projection would, re would result from their possession of ballistic missiles even if they have no actual intention to strike the United States or its allies. Whether or not a third party would launch its missiles against the United States is, in this respect, absolutely unimportant. Their use would be as a withheld deterrent threat. Remarks by Colonel Gaddafi are instructive in this regard, and I quote, if the Americans know that you have a deterrent force capable of hitting the United States, they would not be able to hit you. If we had possessed a deterrent, missiles that could reach New York, we would have hit it at the same moment. Consequently, we should build this force so that they and others will no longer think about, it, think about an attack. Other statements concerning possible third-party ballistic missiles are more chilling. For example, Abu Abbas, the head of the Palestine Liberation Front, noted recently, someday an Arab country will have ballistic missiles. Someday an Arab country will have a nuclear bomb. It is better for the United States and Israel to reach peace with the Palestinians before that day, close quote. Clearly, the deterrent and even coercive value of ballistic missile threats, particularly against the United States, is well appreciated by some of those seeking to acquire them. Critics of GPALS claim, however, that there is no foreseeable missile threat to the United States. Such claims simply are wrong. Given the trend in proliferation, the direct threat to the United States will grow. Secretary of Defense Cheney has specifically stated that, and I quote, the trend is clearly in the direction of systems of increasing range and sophistication. Within the decade, the continental United States could be in the range of ballistic missiles of several third world nations. Other senior officials have made similar statements. Nevertheless, critics of GPALS discount the potential for third, world, for third world countries and third parties to acquire reliable, accurate, nuclear armed ICBMs during the 1990s. It's important to recall in this regard that third party missiles need not be accurate or highly reliable to constitute a fearsome deterrent to the United States and its allies. And two, chemical and biological weapons and missiles with less than ICBM range can also constitute a very serious direct threat to the United States. Perhaps most importantly, discussing only those threats likely to develop during the remainder of this decade is highly misleading. Missile defenses for the United States will not be ready until the latter half of the 1990s in any event, and will have to cope with the threats of the early 21st century very soon thereafter. Nobody here can be sanguine about long-range threats in even the early years of the next century because the trends are all in the direction of longer range and more sophisticated systems, as Secretary of De Defense Cheney noted. Consequently, to look only to the end of this decade for missile threats is an artificial timeline that is absurdly short-sighted. It frequently, frequently is, is asserted that if third parties were to threaten the United States, they would not use ballistic missiles. Rather, they would use ships, commercial aircraft, trucks, or saboteurs. However, rather than relying on aircraft, ship, truck, or saboteur to deliver a weapon, ballistic missiles are emerging as the weapon of choice for third parties because they offer several advantages. For example, unless missile defenses are deployed, ballistic missiles working properly are certain to reach their target. There is no such certainty with any other delivery option. Recall that during the Gulf War, Saddam Hussein did not send in airstrikes against Israel or Saudi Arabia, much less trucks or barges. Saddam used Scud missiles because, in contrast to the vulnerable Iraqi Air Force, until the arrival of Patriot, his Scud missiles could strike quickly and could not be countered effectively. In addition, ballistic missiles, not trucks, barges, or aircraft, or saboteurs, are best suited for a deterrence mission. To be effective, a deterrent threat must be well known and communicated in advance and believed by the party to be deterred. Trucks, barges, or saboteurs are unlikely to be useful as means of deterrence. Saboteurs must use stealth and are notoriously unreliable. Trucks, barges, and aircraft similarly are not preferred for deterrence purposes because there is considerable chance of interception in each case. 
particularly because defensive precautions can be taken. In contrast, ballistic missiles are excellent because in the absence of defenses, they cannot be intercepted and they can be highly visible and communicate a deterrent threat well. In addition, using barges, trucks, aircraft, or saboteurs would place highly valued weapons in the hands of a small number of individuals outside sovereign territory and beyond firm control. In contrast, missiles can be relied on to strike their targets and remain located on sovereign territory, protected by the most reliable elite guards until just minutes before they strike. These factors explain why leaders and experts from developing countries have identified their goal as the acquisition of missiles, including long-range missiles, for coercion and deterrence purposes. The fact that some American commentators discount the third-party missile threat is hardly reassuring. I might add that many senior Soviet leaders and experts have expressed great concern about this very same threat and have endorsed missile defense as a proper response. In short, third parties, by their own admission, are motivated to acquire, acquire and use ballistic missiles for a number of important reasons because missiles offer key advantages over other means of delivery. They will remain the weapon of choice in many cases, at least until defensive countermeasures can be deployed. My conclusions are clear. When the foreseeable and likely ballistic missile threats of the late 1990s and early 21st century are considered, initiating deployment of strategic and theater missile defense is not only reasonable, but essential for future U.S. allied and Soviet security. No alternatives, I repeat, no alternatives to missile defense, either alone or in combination, can constitute a reliable response to these emerging and foreseeable missile threats. Thank you. Uh, I know you abbreviated your remarks, Dr. Payne, and I appreciate it very much. Uh, may I direct the uh, witnesses' uh, attention to the uh, chart uh, that indicates five nations now have nuclear ballistic missiles. Then we have a group of four nations that are doing research on space launch vehicles that might be used as missiles. And then we have about 14 countries with short-range ballistic missiles, uh, which is the threat SDI uh, addresses. And I, I'd like you to think about the accuracy of that chart. If, if there are any reservations or objections, uh, please let them be known. I'm going to put my several questions in block because uh, we have so many of our colleagues here that I know want to join in uh, asking you one or two questions that may be important. Uh, we have one witness here who has testified sincerely that Soviet nuclear weapons could fall into the hands of irresponsible uh, leadership in that country. And I think that that is perhaps uh, an important question that, that ought to be addressed by those of you who may not be in agreement. And, uh, and I'd like to identify among those of you who think that there, there is a problem uh, of a nuclear ballistic missile threat to the United States to identify which specific countries you believe pose a nuclear ballistic missile threat to the United States. And finally, uh, I'd like to uh, ask Dr. Zimmerman, since he raised it, uh, the, uh, the uh, hypothet of a uh, of a uh, commanding officer on a Soviet ship coming into the Gulf of Mexico and unloading all 20 missile tubes against the United States without a Soviet center authorization, which is a threat that drives the size of g -Pols and the non-Warner defenses. Uh, we, wanted, uh, we want to examine that credibility or that possibility. And so I, I throw these uh, questions out for your comment. Let's, let's start off with Dr. Blair and we'll go right down the, the, the table for any reservations or, or elaborations. Okay, that you I'll skip the, sec the second question. Um, the, the third question had uh, to do with the uh, uh, hunt for Red October threat and I think I've addressed that in my testimony. I think it's not a credible threat that Soviet safeguards on ballistic missile submarines of all modern classes are so strict that it, it, it's not plausible that the submarine crew could launch an attack against the United States on their own. 
On the first question, uh, could Soviet nuclear weapons fall into irresponsible, the hands of irresponsible leaders? Um, I think Soviet nuclear weapons uh, could, as I said in the state, statement, fall, uh, become, uh, fall under the control of uh, coup plotters or other irresponsible leaders, and that is a major uh, worry, I think, for, for the world. There is no adequate safeguard against misbehavior at the very apex of government in any country. There is no answer to the question, who guards the guards? Um, but here, if you are worried, I think you have to be worried about a decision that could lead to a massive attack. GPALS doesn't address the problem of irresponsible leadership uh, of Soviet nuclear forces. It addresses the problem of aberrant behavior at low levels in the chain of command. Mm -hmm. And that threat is not plausible to me. Thank you very much. Mr. Hildreth. Let me just make a, a few comments, sort of detailed technical comments on the, on the chart. Um, one, I, I would add uh, Romania. Romania has a, a, a bunch of uh, uh, scuds and uh, short-range frogs that, that would fall onto, uh, that, that could arguably be placed on that chart. In addition, countries, uh, NATO countries like uh, Belgium, uh, Britain, Germany, Italy, Netherlands, um, they all have uh, short-range systems, but given President Bush's uh, speech, those are all likely to go over the next few years. In the case of former Warsaw Pact countries, Bulgaria and Poland, uh, uh, as I understand it, um, the, the, the warheads, the nuclear warheads on those systems were, have been removed, but it's uncertain whether they still have the missiles. And so a question could arise, you know, what are they going to do with the missiles? And then finally, one other case where I, there's no clear answer um, as to whether they have these short-range rockets anymore, we're talking about Algeria. And other than that, that's the only uh, changes I would make to that chart. And let me add one, make one comment. Uh, someone said, uh, uh, someone quoted Secretary Cheney that uh, some countries by the end of this decade could have a, a ballistic missile capability um, uh, yeah. uh, to, to hit the United States. And I think there's a, so it's an oblique reference to, to Brazil. Um, Brazil certainly has uh, that, that capability, but, um, and, and in the, the SDIO's uh, presentations, uh, they, they have this big circle uh, coming out of Brazil. Uh, showing that the United States is a potential target. And, and, and I think that if you talk to Brazilians, uh, they'd find that insulting. I know in the conversations that I've had with Brazilians, um, I, I lived in Brazil for a couple of years in the mid-70s, and I have no, no interest in, uh, in, in it as a, as, a, as a region other than just keep track and f listen, you know, have people come through our division occasionally. And I, every once in a while I'll pull out this chart and this uh, citation from SGIO that Brazil is a potential threat, and it's in the, the document I have in front of me, you know, and frankly, they're insulted. You know, I live there. These people, um, they, they have tremendous admiration and respect for America, and they, they, they just find that idea just, you know, not, not compelling at all. And the same thing, and if you look at North Korea, I think I'd you know, challenge anyone to calculate distances between you know North Korea and any target, including you know some remote islands in Alaska, um, as a potential target, and whether they'd have that capability within 10, 15 years, it's just yeah, I don't know where the threat is. Thank you so much, Dr. Zimmerman. With uh, with Steve's addenda to the chart, I would have to say I concur. I would note that the uh, the Scud missile has become the Kalashnikov of the mu the missile era. It's built with minor variants all over the world. Uh, one notes Korea and China, North Korea and China uh, to begin with. And uh, it's in relatively uh, open commerce. Uh, one can't tell for sure where SCUDs will pop up next. Uh, but I think the, the list is a, a, a good guess. Uh, you've asked me, specifically me, to comment on the Red October threat. First, let me refer you back to Bruce. Uh, in terms of the credibility of the threat, I find it utterly incredible. Let me explain, though, why it drives the size and cost of GPALs. If you're going to try and intercept 200 warheads launched more or less simultaneously, at any conceivable point in the United States, you need many more than 200 interceptors. You need probably 200 interceptors at each of five or six points. Because the, uh, the hypothesis is that the Red October is close to our shores, the warning time is short, 
which deprives you of the ability to do a shoot look and then shoot at missed uh, targets uh, mode of interception, which means that in effect you have to dispatch two interceptors at every warhead. That forces the system very, to be very much larger than it might have to be to intercept, for example, uh, a few missiles from, the eight missiles from China, let us say, or uh, uh, a few missiles from any of the other countries. I would like to make a couple of comments, if I can have a moment, on some other testimony that was offered. I want to say that I was not surprised by the size and the scope of the Iraqi nuclear threat, uh, the Iraqi nuclear program. And I don't have intelligence clearances anymore. <laughs> I deduced that Iraq had a sizable program and was getting close to having a nuclear explosive device or a bomb wholly from the open literature. And I will tell you that I am on public record in published writings to that effect. This is not a, uh, an after the fact uh, statement. Finally, I would like to question Dr. Payne on one point. He has said that uh, we would be deterred, perhaps paralyzed was the word, by the, th the very threat of a, an attack from a third world country. Let me ask you, uh, as political leaders, if supposing you had GPALs, which had never been tested in a full-blown crisis situation, would you as national leaders rely upon it so much that you would discount the threat, a credible threat, from a country known to possess long-range nuclear armed missiles? I personally would not. And I would submit that possession of GPALs would not restore our freedom of maneuver against such a threat. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Kramer. Sir, on the chart, it looks to me like a good one. I would uh, hope that you would also put into your record the Strategic Defense Initiative Organization's briefing of last December on classified, which spells out these things in some interesting scenarios as well as just citing the, the missiles themselves. It projects scenarios where some might be used and where we might have to get involved or might have our interests and people endangered. Uh, on the question of GPALs that was raised by Mr. Blair, he says that it, won't, it is not the answer to irresponsible uh, leaders taking possession, which he acknowledges is a, is a real possibility in the future because we can't predict that that won't happen. GPALS is the beginning. If you don't begin with the first acknowledgement that we need strategic defenses and that mutual assured destruction as a basis for deterrence is destabilizing and is, in my opinion, unethical, unethical, then we can't ever get the kind of defenses that, that we desperately will need increasingly through the century and into the next. It's of course not the answer in and of itself, but it's the beginning, it's the basic step. And as for Mr. Um, Hildreth's uh, comment that earlier on that capability verifies the threat, capability also causes a threat. If all these capabilities are out there, even as nice a country as Brazil, might have at some point an unfriendly head of state or somebody might steal the technology. These represent capabilities that are coming and unless you do assume that men are angels, you cannot assume that they will always remain out of evil hands. Governments can change. Even if the Soviet Union is right now on a good path, it may change. And the answer that Mr. Zimmerman gives to this situation where he calls for more intelligence as to handle the incipient threat, that's his phrase. Intelligence can't handle the missile when it's coming at you. It can't. You better have a deployed defense. And the incipient threat that is out there now is this threat. That is a threat. And the answer to it is not only more intelligence, and I mean raw intelligence in the, uh, what the CIA does, it also means intelligence in the head, and it means common sense and heart, and that means prepare to deploy. And it certainly means deploy, deployment possibilities. And that's why the comments of my colleague, Mr. Pike, are not proper to speak about these very serious things as involving Chicken Little and Darth Vader. They involve our children. This is not a laughing matter. I'm astonished that this would be used in serious uh, discourse on a serious issue. 
Now, I should tell you that I've spent some of my life in two wars. I was as a child held hostage in Germany in a cellar. I'm British by birth. I saw what war can do and I saw what miscalculations about peace in our time, missile peace in our time can bring you. And I've also been in Vietnam on nine different occasions during the war. These are not joking matters. We can be blackmailed, we can be threatened. My sons can lose their lives if the right decisions are not made now to get going on defenses. I thank you for this opportunity. Did, did you, uh, I think you included Brazil as one of the, the dangers. No, I did not, sir. You do, you do not. I said capability represents, can represent threat. They could represent In a future threat. century, that's right. Did you, do you have any opposition to us selling them a supercomputer that had implications with reference I to? I would, yes. I would have opposition to that. I think we did it already, didn't we? We, we sold I, them a computer. I think our recently. tech transfer needs to be tightened enormously in all directions, all right. including still, I believe, towards the East, towards the Soviet Union, until they get their democratic institutions in place, and, and any other country, yes. Well, I thank you for your response. Mr. Pike. We're returning to the question of exactly where the threat's coming from. Um, uh, Mr. Kramer characterized Brazil as a uh, capability that's coming, but I think that if you look at the developments in the Brazilian space program over the last couple of years, particularly earlier this year when they've been soliciting on the international marketplace uh, from uh, China, from the Soviet Union, and from ver various American companies, uh, asking to purchase uh, launch services to launch some of their satellites over the next couple of years. And if you also look at the dismal uh, reliability and success record that they've had with their own launch vehicles, I think that uh, it's highly questionable whether this uh, Brazilian threat to Key West is something that's in any danger of materializing in this century. Um, I also think that if one looks at the, at the minimum technical requirements for launching an attack on New York City, which seems to be the um, thing that everybody keeps coming around to, that it's not simply the absence of uh, technical capabilities that has presented, prevented Abu Nidal or Muammar Gaddafi from blowing up Lower Manhattan. Um, either of those uh, uh, bad conduct characters, or I think literally any other country or in any other terrorist group uh, could easily blow up Lower Manhattan uh, using a fertilizer bomb. Uh, ammonium nitrate is the essential explosive component in the daisy cutter, the very large bombs that we used against uh, Iraq. Uh, the Defense Nuclear Agency uses uh, this ammonium nitrate fuel oil explosive to uh, simulate uh, nuclear, the effects of nuclear weapons. And in fact, in 1985, in the minor scale uh, test, they simulated an eight kiloton nuclear explosion using ammonium nitrate fuel oil explosives. So I think that, uh, the, that if Gaddafi was really interested in blowing up New York, he would take a tramp steamer, load it up with 10,000 tons of ammonium nitrate, hose it down with fuel oil, and sail it into New York Harbor. And there's nothing that the Coast Guard is going to do to defend us against tramp steamers that are loaded with ammonium nitrate. The fact that uh, this is something that would easily be within the reach of the smallest power around the planet and has been readily available from open literature for many decades now. The fact that something like this has not happened suggests to me that there are reasons other than the absence of mere technical capability that are preventing this from happening. And it's very difficult for me to imagine that somebody is going to go after New York or go after Washington in the one way that's going to put a return address on the delivery system because a rocket provides unambiguous uh, indications of where it's coming from, whereas one of these fertilizer bombs could come from anywhere. Mm. Thank you, sir. Dr. Payne? Thank you. Um, let me comment first on the chart. Since it doesn't list a time frame, at least that I can see, no. for, this, uh, for these ranges, it's hard to say that it's accurate or inaccurate, because obviously time lines are very important with this kind of capability. Let me just say, though, that given the public evidence that we have, uh, it appears to not include the potential for a space launch vehicle from Pakistan, South Korea, or Taiwan, and the ranges that might be associated with those. And the public evidence that I cite on that is simply from a recent Adelphi paper from the International Institute for Strategic Studies, and I don't believe that is listed. Those missiles or those ranges are listed on your chart. Um, let me talk briefly about the threats as a sort of a follow-on to the, that, that point. Uh, Mr. Cheney hasn't specified public, as far as I know, which countries he was referring to. 
when he said that several third world countries may threaten the United States during the end of the decade. Uh, so I can't comment on that. Brazil may be one of those. I don't know. Uh, the fact that identifying Brazil as a potential threat makes some members of this panel uncomfortable is not a major concern for me. I mean, what we see in international relations is that previous allies can become enemies very soon. I suspect that the uh, Argentinians didn't worry the British very much before the Falkland Wars in 1982, uh, but we saw that things happened very quickly in 1982. So the point is that international relations makes strange bedfellows and, and uh, even stranger enemies in very short order. So putting up any list that suggests that there are several third world countries that can threaten the United States before the end of the 1990s is con it would be of concern to me. But when you look at this overall, this kind of approach that simply lists countries and their potential capabilities really is a misleading approach to look at the threat. The reason I say that is because what we understand and know with regard to the proliferation process is that many third world countries are cooperating in the development, production, and deployment of ballistic missiles. This isn't an individual country activity. Let me just give you well, one example or several examples of this. Uh, for example, Syria has reportedly contracted for delivery of more than 150 SCUDs at the cost of $500 million. Two shipments have already arrived. North Korea has been working with Egypt to build a SCUD production facility outside Cairo and may have signed a contract for SCUD seas with Libya. Uh, this is all public information, but this network of ballistic missiles and cooperation with regard to the production of ballistic missiles is rampant and has been going on since the 1980s. And so to look at an individual country and not look at the network of cooperation and joint programs is a real mistake when trying to look at what the threat might be 10 years from now. Let me comment very briefly also on the, the question that you put to the panel with regard to Soviet accidents. I must say that I think it's a very difficult a very difficult problem for us to sit here and try and say whether there is likely to be an accident from the Soviet missile arsenal or whether there's not likely to be an accident. I simply say that we probably don't know enough specific information about the Soviet command and control system and the circumstances that would surround that to draw any conclusions. What I do know is that if there is an accident, whatever its probability, it could be the worst disaster in U.S. history. So even if the chances are low, the outcomes could be absolutely cat catastrophic, so we can't ignore this threat. Let me respond also by noting that many Soviet leaders have acknowledged and discussed the possible threat from nuclear weapons, a loss of control of nuclear weapons in the midst of a civil war in the Soviet Union. Let me just give you one quote from a leading Soviet commentator now. In fact, this is Colonel Viktor Alksnes, who's the head of Soyuz, which is a leading faction of hardliners within the Congress of People's Deputies. Uh, so uh, Alksnes says, our country cannot just cannot collapse peacefully and disintegrate peacefully. This will be connected with a civil war, an application of nuclear weapons, and only God knows where these missiles will fly, to Kiev, Riga, or Washington, D.C. Now, I have no idea how much credibility to, to attach to that particular statement, but what I do know is that there are a number of Soviet commentators who are making perhaps not this quite dramatic statement, but <laughs> statements that suggest, that suggest this loss of control could in fact be a real problem, and I'm not going to dispute them at this point. Let me make one last point, and that is with regard to something that uh, one of my colleagues here on the panel said, and that is, in effect, uh, deterrence works. It's sort of the Alfred E. Newman approach to this issue. Deterrence works, so why worry? What me worry? Uh, the, the problem is that we know that there are certain conditions under which deterrence doesn't work. I've looked at over 100 case studies going back to 200 B.C analyzing deterrence in crises. And what we know is that deterrence frequently doesn't work. In fact, it's the norm. How many times did you find out they didn't work? I beg your pardon? How many times did you find out that they, the deterrence did not work? From the case studies that we looked at, as I said, approximately 100 going back to 200 BC, it looks like deterrence worked as we understand deterrence about a third of the time. About of the third of the time, it's clear that deterrence was not working, that leaders weren't making decisions based on any kind of deterrence understanding that we know, and about another third of the time, it's sort of hard to tell what the heck was going on. The point is that there are very, very strict conditions under which deterrence can be reliable. And I suggest very strongly that as we move into the 1990s and the 21st century, and we meet a multiplicity of threats, that those conditions for deterrence to work are unlikely to be there very frequently. Thank you. All of your comments were enlightening, diverse, and yet helpful. 
I, I turn now to Mr. Frank Horton, the gentleman from New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I know that we have a limited time, and I have a number of questions for each of the witnesses, which I'll submit in writing and then ask you for the record to um, reply so that we can put them in the record. But I'd just like to ask um, two or three general questions, which perhaps uh, some of you could comment on. It has to do with the no so-called non warner one-site proposal. As I understand, according to their handout, uh, they claim that, this would, that their proposal would protect some 78 percent of, of the United States against limited attacks. And does anybody have any reason to challenge that figure? And then I've also, um, I'd like to ask you to just comment on um, um, the, the, at least I heard over the weekend that President Gorbachev talked about the necessity to guard against accidental or unauthorized ballistic missile attacks. And if that is the case, uh, why shouldn't we build at least a limited system? And then uh, thirdly, um, since one site can be built within the ABM treaty provisions and the Soviets have one, why shouldn't we at least build a single location which is called for in, in non warner So perhaps you could comment on that, perhaps starting with you, Dr. Blair. You don't have to make a long statement, just generally um, how, how you uh, react to those. Um. Well, as, as I've said, I <coughs> think that we do know enough about Soviet safeguards to believe that this threat of an unauthorized attack is not plausible. And I can only um, stand on that statement and, and, and suggest that we continue a dialogue which, uh, ha which Gennady Pavlov and I and some others have started uh, under the auspices of the International Foundation uh, uh, three months ago, continue this dialogue to seek reassurance that uh, these safeguards are adequate and that furthermore methods exist to uh, protect against accidental launch as well. So I think that uh, the uh, proposal to deploy the first site in North Dakota, which presumably would be focused on the Soviet problem, it's the only one that exists at the moment, to me just doesn't square with what we know or think we know about Soviet safeguards. I doubt whether a single site would provide very much coverage. I think uh, the SDIO position on this is pretty clear. They propose a uh, 1,000 interceptors in space, seven or 800 interceptors on the ground, and improved sensors to provide protection for the country to a, a level of about 95 percent of up to 95 percent of the 200 warheads that could be lofted against the United States. So if 200 warheads were lofted against the United States with only one ground-based site in existence, I think, uh, though the coverage may be extensive in terms of of geography, the effectiveness of the system would be so poor that you, you really couldn't argue that it provided you, any significant well, coverage. Well, then you, you question you question the 78 percent coverage uh, claim. I, I, I'm trying to redefine, I'm trying to question the uh, definition of that term. It may yes. be able to intercept some target uh, that could be uh, over 70, anywhere over 70 percent of the land mass of the United States, but it may, uh, it may have that range but it may not do so effectively or successfully, and the target may, in fact, get through the system. Mr. Hildreth? Well, I obviously can't comment on whether we should do it or not, <laughs> um, so, I, so I won't. But I will make a couple com um, comments on, on the relevant threat, and I'm just going to talk about third country threats in this regard. Um, with respect to an LPS, uh, the threat, unless I hear someone else on the panel offer otherwise, the only threat that I, that I can see over the next 10 to 15 years um, and we're talking about non-Soviet, to the continental United States, for which an LPS would protect against, would come from China. They currently have five to ten of those missiles with possible countermeasures on, on some of those missiles. Um, as far as coverage, uh, I, I've seen all kinds of studies that say they'll cover all of the southern part of the continental United States, excluding Hawaii and Alaska, or almost all of it. And so whether you know, it's, it's not going to include Hawaii and it's not going to include Alaska. That's a given. Um, the degree to which it covers all the rest of the United States, uh, I mean, talk to industry, talk to SGIO, and they'll give you an answer. But, but, but that's the threat we're talking about. And, you know, in, uh, you know outside the Soviet threat or, or Soviet Denver. systems. I have no reason to either challenge or to particularly accept the uh, estimate of 78 percent coverage. Uh, the reason for that is that it is 
far too dependent, that number is far too dependent upon technological decisions and technological capabilities which are at this point still undetermined and, and the determination is far in the future. I would think that uh, a single site could provide modest coverage against a few warheads for most of the United States and I would, would leave my discussion of the quantitative discussion that unquantitative. As you know, as I said in, in my prepared statement, I have little against uh, the notion of erecting, building one treaty compliant site so long as uh, it is treaty compliant uh, if you want to spend the dollars. But I would ask that the Congress take into account the need to test that system and include in the authorization and appropriation legislation what I call realistic testing. Mandate that the Army pull one interceptor from a silo every six months or a year, take it down to Kwajalein Island, which is our designated, one of our two designated ABM test ranges, and have a regular missile crew stand on alert for a period of two weeks and be told during that time Vandenberg will fire one missile at you. Get the warhead. I would then cut off communication between Vandenberg and Kwajalein so that the, uh, the launch, the, the, the offense could not hold fire until the defense was ready. I would insist that the test look something like uh, a real engagement. Finally, even though we have Grand Forks as a site, uh, I question its utility uh, as the site for uh, a single site defense. Several years ago I thought that was a good idea and I asked the Army to please give me a tour of Grand Forks. They finally did. It took several months to negotiate uh, a three hour visit and they showed me the silos from the outside and the missile site radar from the outside. At the time I wrote that uh, the silos appeared and their headworks do appear to be in good condition and that the Army had told me that the missile site radar building was hermetically sealed, filled with dry nitrogen, and was clean, dry, and rust free on the inside. In recent weeks, people have visited that site and have insisted that the Army open the building. I am told, I've seen in Defense News, that the interior of the MSR is rotten. It's flooded, it's rusty. In short, I was sold a bill of goods and I suspect that there are very few assets at Grand Forks at the Nakoma site that are really worth resurrecting. Thank you. Mr. Kramer. Uh, sir, the uh, Nun Warner uh, position is part of the Strategic Defense uh, Missile Act or the Missile Defense Act, which states as three goals providing a highly effective defense of the U.S. against limited attacks, maintaining strategic stability, and gaining uh, effective theater missile defenses. I think within those terms, the one site at North Dakota is a beginning in that direction towards that goal. I believe that they are viewing the northern attack corridor from the Soviet Union as the main and initial threat to be faced, and therefore probably the figure 78 percent relates to a threat from that direction. Of course, if you see where the threats could come from the east, the west, and the south, there's no way of uh, holding that percentage uh, uh, submarine threat and so on. And I don't think it's intended that way. I'd like to see what, where the figure comes from in its context. Um, as for the one or two sites or more issue, I pointed out before that a communique signed by the heads of state of the Soviet Union and the United States at a summit pledged us to adhere to the ABM treaty as signed in 1972 that does permit two sites. There's no question that either a mistake was made at the point of the communique or we are back to 1972 and away from the protocol of 74. When I worked here on the staff with Mr. Jack Kemp, we asked this question in the past of the Secretary of State, which was it? We didn't get an answer. I, I do believe from having talked to senior U.S. officials that they made a mistake. And one of the hurry up things that occurred at summits, a bad sentence was written. In fact, however, we should, I believe, as a minimum, hold now the Soviet leader to the fact that two sites uh, are permitted under, under the communique. And I believe that, of course, we should not only renegotiate, we should not renegotiate the ABM treaty, we should put it aside 
as obsolete and broken. It's a broken contract. We put aside SALT I and SALT II in 1986, uh, proposed an interim restraint policy at that time, which indicated in President Reagan's uh, words and promise that we would not take advantage of putting aside that treaty and that we wanted to go down to the reductions that he had sought. That's a similar pattern. We've done it before. It was predicted ahead of time that if we put SALT I and SALT II, two broken agreements, one not even ratified, the other one expired sort of in its own terms uh, because the Americans had condi uh, conditioned acceptance of ABM Treaty to a five-year uh, period by which we needed to get the offensive arms reductions, which never came. Uh, when the President in 1986 put aside those two treaties, the world did not collapse. Uh, neither Chicken Little nor Darth Vader appeared on the horizon, and we went on with our business. I think this was what we should do with this broken Humpty Dumpty of a contract of the ABM Treaty get away from mutual assured destruction and move forward. And let me just mention one very quick thing about the Iraqi danger and about U.S. intelligence, which has been praised here so highly. Uh, on, uh, on January 23rd, President Bush said, our pinpoint attacks have put Saddam out of the nuclear bomb building business for a long time to come. He was wrong. Recently, Ms. Tutwiler at the State Department has said the following. The fact is that Iraq had an unsafeguarded covert uranium enrichment program that it hid from the United Nations, the International Atomic Energy Agency, and special international inspection teams inside Iraq. She might have added, they also successfully hid it from the United States and all of its intelligence agencies and all of the experts in the debate last fall, which was very intense about whether we had a legitimate purpose in being concerned about Iraq or didn't, including the nuclear danger. All those experts were wrong that discounted the danger. Our intelligence did not work. We were not left unprotected. This is a scenario that I believe can come more likely than not as this uh, decade ends and into the next century. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Pike? Um, very briefly, um, I wouldn't quarrel with approximately an 80 percent um, geographical coverage of the United States from one side, but I think you'd also have to recognize that some 80 percent of the American population would be outside of that coverage. And I think that most of the participants in this debate recognize that deploying a single site at Grand Forks uh, is either going to be a waste of money because we don't go beyond that or, from my perspective, would be a waste of money because we would have to go beyond that to deploy the half dozen uh, sites with the some thousand interceptors that most people uh, acknowledge as being sort of the minimum that you have to do in order to defend the entire United States. I wouldn't see any reason for deploying something at Grand Forks uh, other than as uh, simply the first of half a dozen sites that you'd be deploying. And if you're going to deploy half a dozen, Grand Forks is probably uh, not the place to start. Turning to the question of whether our intelligence was adequate in the case of Iraq, clearly there are a lot of things that you can do under factory roofs that American intelligence is going to have a hard time detecting. Fortunately, uh, particularly for the topic of our hearing today, the one thing that you can't do under a factory roof, the one thing that you have to do out in the open where American technical intelligence is extremely good, is that you have to test long-range missiles uh, uh, by actually flying them. Uh, I think that the historical experience that uh, we've demonstrated over the last three decades is that in order to have a missile that's sufficiently reliable that you're going to put a valuable payload on it, such as a nuclear warhead, you generally need at least 20 tests before you sign off that thing as being something that you care to rely on. In the case of the Chinese, it took them two decades of a very intensive effort on their part to go from where Iraq uh, was before the war, having scuds, to having long-range ICBMs that uh, they could confidently feel would be able to reach targets on the other side of the planet. So while we might have questions about our intelligence capabilities against uh, third world nuclear programs, I think that our intelligence capabilities against third world ballistic missile delivery systems, which is after all what SDI is designed to deal with, are obviously going to be very good because those missiles are going to have to be tested, they'll have to be re tested repeatedly, that'll take a long time, and we're certainly going to see it coming. Thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Payne? Uh, a single site I think would be useful but insufficient is probably the best way to put it, and it certainly wouldn't, would not adequately meet the objectives of the Senate Missile Defense Act. Uh, yes, I would suggest that we should initiate deployment uh, during this decade and of the additional sites necessary uh, as the Missile Defen Defense Act uh, identifies could be necessary to meet its objectives. But let me mention one thing about testing because it's pertinent to this subject. If we have a long, long period in which we would see missile threats developing, 
then the notion is, as Mr. Pike just suggested, that we will see this testing and we can deploy when necessary. Unfortunately, it's, it's more or less a fairly ethnocentric view of how other countries do things. I mean, it's as if they have to do it the way we do it, and because we test a lot, they must have to test a lot. Let me mention that according to public data, there was no known Iraqi test of the multiple Scud B motor satellite launch vehicle prior to the December 1990 test, which turned out to be successful. We did not see a long test series, according to public information. Supplies to nuclear weapons as well. Let me mention that Israel, at least according to public information, appears to have developed nuclear weapons without tests, or at least not tests that we've been able to monitor. Uh, South Africa appears, at least according to public information, to have developed a nuclear weapon without tests, at least that we've been reliably able to monitor. Pakistan probably is uh, a nuclear weapons state, according to public information, and we have not seen a Pakistani test, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So saying that we're going to have this long period of watching tests before we should go ahead and think about these types of threats, I suspect is, uh, is taking a fairly narrow approach to the, the problem. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to commend the um, members of the panel. I think they brought some expert uh, advice uh, to the committee, and uh, we appreciate it. Thank you. Gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Glenn English. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I would like to outline what I, it would appear to me to be the situation and give each of the opportunity to tell me where I'm wrong. It would appear to me that uh, as far as dealing with the situation, the instability within the Soviet Union, if we're going to develop a system, put a system in place to guard against uh, some kind of accidental launching or launching that may take place because of some unrest within the Soviet Union, it's highly unlikely we're going to get that done. That's most likely going to be settled within the, the, hopefully within the next few years. And if there's anything that comes out of that, we're not going to have a system in place to do anything about it. So the system that we're really talking about is against uh, the most likely scenario, the, uh, the Gaddafi uh, uh, type of, uh, of madman who uh, may in some way get, gain control of the country and somehow develop a, a nuclear device and, and then develop some kind of long-range delivery system to uh, uh, fire that uh, uh, missile against uh, the United States in which we hope to have something to deal with it. It would appear to me that if the United States does go ahead and develops a system to deal with that kind of a scenario, to cover the United States, protect the United States against a limited number of nuclear missiles that are fired against us, that uh, that's going to be well known and understood. Uh, then uh, this so-called madman, uh, uh, a Qaddafi type, would appear to use some other way of delivering that nuclear device in the United States, whether it be through smuggled in the United States, through a freight or whatever it may be, to, to get it here. Uh, that's, and, and we still are faced with the same problem. So I guess what all this comes around to is that if, in fact, we are not likely to face a doomsday scenario against the Soviet Union that we're dealing with, and if, in fact, the unrest of the Soviet Union is, is likely to pretty much be out of the way and settled before we could ever get such a device in place and that would be reliable, and third, if, in fact, we do deliver, uh, develop it, put it in place, uh, then it uh, can be uh, uh, that a uh, uh, madman type uh, of uh, Hussein Gaddafi would likely uh, uh, then use some other kind of delivery system, smuggling it in or some other way rather than using a missile. You know, where, where are we? You know, what, what have we gained? Uh, if we're, in fact, if our overall objective is to protect U.S. citizens, U.S. property within the continental U.S. Uh, against a nuclear attack, you know, where is it that we gain the protection and advantage uh, under uh, that kind of scenario if we no longer face a, a massive attack from the Soviet Union? Dr. Blair, I'll let you start out. Well, I think your, your summary of the situation is, is right on target, and um, I uh, don't have any difficulties with it. I think that we should focus this entire debate on uh, the, the alleged threat of third, war, of third countries, uh, that the situation in the Soviet Union is uh, politically uh, <clears throat> unstable in some respects, but that the implications of that instability uh, bear much more heavily on tactical nuclear weapons issues than on the control of strategic nuclear forces 
which uh, represent the SDIO threat against which GPALS is being sized. So uh, I think that we can rather quickly uh, dispose of the Soviet problem and to the extent that there are residual questions about their systems that we should discuss um, the problem and possible solutions. SDIO has, has advanced a threat of accidental or unauthorized launch of Soviet weapons. And if that's the case, it's in the mutual interest of both sides to prevent it from happening and to devise measures that uh, uh, ensure that if it did happen, the weapons could be uh, destroyed in flight or uh, in, other w in other ways uh, handled. And so I think that uh, there's uh, an opportunity to work out solutions to any conceivable threat of accidental or unauthorized Soviet launch with the Soviets directly. The Soviets have gone some distance in this direction already and have, in fact, uh, technical capabilities that could possibly even be modified to provide for things like post-launch destruction. The Soviets have a system on their modern ballistic missile submarines and land-based submarines. They have a device on, on these missiles that includes an explosive charge designed to destroy, self-destroy, uh, a missile that f flies off of its proper trajectory. So that, for example, if the Soviets deliberately fired a missile against China in a, in a conflict and it accidentally uh, or somehow that we should discuss in collaboration with the Soviet Union uh, to, to handle that issue. So I think, we, I think the fate of GPALs should live or die on the plausibility of threats from third countries, which, uh, from, as I've gathered from the testimony today, uh, represents a long-term threat, not a one that's going to materialize anytime soon. Children? Let me comment, make a couple comments um, about the uh, long-range threat from some specific countries. Let me be specific. And again, I, I, I think it's important to be specific as we think about these things because it's one thing to talk generically about a long-range missile threat to the United States, but we need to know who we're talking about. Could, um, could I add, add just one point on that? The thing that keeps bothering me about this is if, 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 in fact, we're talking about develop a third world country developing a long-range missile, and that seems to be where we are, you know, I don't know why they'd bother. You know, the thing that trouble, I don't know why they'd bother. I mean, we've got tons of cocaine shipped into this country every day. They don't have any trouble getting that stuff in here. And it's my understanding that you, uh, if, if a country finally reaches the point that they can develop a nuclear device, that nuclear device will be packed away in a suitcase, a small one. And certainly for, for the purposes of terrorism, and that's basically what we're talking about on third world countries, that does the job. So why in the world would you go to the expense, the bother, and, and all the trouble of developing a nuclear dev a, a long-range delivery system for a nuclear device? It's just cheaper, easier, you know, go out and get your twin engine Cessna and, and pipe it on in here. That's an excellent point. Um, I'm looking for people to tell me I'm wrong. I'm hoping I'm wrong. That's, I guess, <laughs> this is what I'm hoping. It's a good point, and it, and it needs all these points need to be to be brought out. They need to be debated. They need to be discussed because it's important. Again, as I stress, to be uh, spe uh, specific. It's one thing to say that you know Brazil, you know Brazilian leadership in the future, for example, might change. That's the one nearest dearest to my heart. Someone else can choose another example. But in the case of Brazil, um, it's it's easy for me to talk about because. You, you look at the history of the U.S.-Brazilian uh, relationship over the last 175 years, and you show me anything there that suggests that there's ever going to be, an, you know, a reason why the Brazilians are going to want to launch a missile at us at all. I mean, there, there's got to be some plausibility in all this. I mean, it's easy to be Tom Clancy, um, but it's not easy to be, you know, uh, realistic about some of these things. I mean, you need to be a little bit more sober-minded, and that's, I think, what we all need to, to think about. But let me talk about some specific countries where there are legitimate concerns, I think, in the minds of some people. And let me talk about countries like Iran, uh, North Korea, Libya, and I put a big question mark, but I'll include it just for point of argument, India. Let's talk about those four countries acquiring a long-range capability to hit the United States with an ICBM. It's important to note that, in, that, in, that, that only three countries have ever developed an ICBM. That's China, the Soviet Union, and the United States. No other country has developed an ICBM. 
for some countries like North Korea and Libya and India and Iran to do that, I mean, we're talking about something, if it's going to happen, much longer than 10, 15 years from now. I don't dismiss the possibility that it might happen, but we're looking at a period of time well beyond that. Um, well, let me interrupt you again because we're, we're short on time. I'm, I'm going to move you right okay. along because I guess the question, is it harder to develop a, a long-range delivery system, ICBM, or is it harder to, to develop a nuclear device to go in it? Well, I'd defer to um, Dr. Zimmerman on that well, because Dr. he's Zimmerman interested in that. Dr. Zimmerman will pass on to you and see if you can. It's uh, easier to design a uh, rather poor nuclear weapon than it is to design a good hand grenade. Uh, it is much easier to design and to construct a first generation or even, I would say, a second or third generation uh, fission weapon along the lines of what the, the Swedes were about to produce in 65. It's easier by far than to develop an intercontinental missile. Unless a, unless a, um, uh, a country had a specific purpose, namely for, for giving them potential to attack the United States. This, this, that would basically be it as far as I can think. Why would you need anything beyond an intermediate or short-range missile? Each nation will judge its own security interests and its own military ambitions. And on the basis of their own assessments will determine how much money they want to spend and let's be very clear, developing an ICBM is extremely, extremely expensive. Okay. Mr. Crane. And they'll have to have a reason to do it. And if you look at the threats, I don't see that any of these countries we've talked about are really going to be motivated to spend that much money. Mr. Kramer. Um, if, if we live or die on the gamble, that Mr. Blair wants us to undertake, and which is implicit in your question, that the threat is only from the third world, then we are already limiting ourselves to the re uh, by not recognizing the reality of uh, the current nations that have weapons, which include one that is quite hostile, China, and one which could again be potentially quite hostile, the Soviet Union. Uh, and also, if we are to m look beyond our shores, American citizens are stationed by, with forces uh, throughout the world. There are citizens engaged in commerce. There are regional allies that are very uh, important to us, strong democratic nations, which could be blackmailed, which could be blackmailed, and against which I believe we need to help defend. And that's why I believe that a ground-based defense based in Grand Forks is only beginning, and why we need to think Beyond, so you wanna, you want I do want to go to the space-based system States because a space-based system doesn't care whether the missile is going from Moscow to Washington, from uh, Baghdad to Tel Aviv, from Tripoli to Rome. When the thing goes up, it's an offensive system, and if all the fail-safe systems that have been described by my colleagues don't work, or it's not, it's not intended that they work by somebody who has an aggressive purpose, then that's the only recourse that we and our children will have at that point, is a deployed defense which is why I think it's an extraordinary gamble uh, to, to just push this aside and to think that good intentioned people will always be at the control of weapons. And I don't mean that, that people will necessarily launch the weapons, but the threat to launch a ballistic missile that can be delivered in a matter of minutes with very little danger of interception as a ship might, if you get intelligence about a ship movement or about a, a suitcase, you may be able to intercept it. At least the person carrying that or ordered to to uh, make a credible threat of that has, in my opinion, a far harder time than, than a commandant or a commander or a criminal um, or a renegade uh, who sits at the command of a ballistic missile submarine or a land station. Uh, and that's why that's a much more realistic and credible threat and much more likely to be used for blackmail purposes. Mm -hmm. Mr. Pike? I don't think that there are any credible reasons for deploying an anti-missile system in this decade. I can't exclude the possibility that at some point in the following decade or in the coming century or in the coming millennium that situation might change, but certainly for the foreseeable time frame, I don't see any plausible threat that would require us to uh, deploy something. Um, well, I guess there's simply uh, not... Could I, could I, I mean, stop you right there? The thing I'm, I'm trying to come back to and you right. all slipped off of it a little bit, it seems, let's assume that we do deploy such a system, can it be easily gotten around? 
Sure, you wrap your bomb in a bale of marijuana and fly it across the border. That's, that's you don't, exactly you don't, my, you, you that's don't. my point. You know, I'm, I'm, I think I'm willing to spend the money, and certainly I'm willing to spend the money on research if this is going to protect the United States from some kind but I, of, I, I of I think device. that this is the least likely threat. That I mean, this is the least plausible threat that we have to face because basically the third world country is going to have to do two impossible things before breakfast. Number one, develop a nuclear weapon, and number two, develop an ICBM, both of which are probably roughly equal uh, in terms of their technical challenge, namely that they're going to take a lot of people a long time and billions and billions of dollars. And it's difficult for me to see how the, how, why this country is going to try to solve both of those problems when by simply solving the nuclear weapons problem and then buying a Cessna. Would, is this a, a Maginot line of the nuclear age? Is that, is that you know, I, Dr. Payne, tell me why that's wrong. <laughs> Uh, Congressman English, you've asked why you were wrong, and let me respectfully tell you why you were wrong. Very good. That's why you're the man I've been waiting for. Take me all the way down the table to get to you. Uh, you basically asked the question about other means of delivery. So why bother with missiles? Let me answer you very specifically. Third world leaders and experts have, according to their own statements, a great desire to deploy and acquire missiles for deterrence purposes. And we shouldn't be surprised that they want to have missiles. They have learned what the superpowers learned in the 1960s, and that is missiles are ideal means for deterrence and coercion, far better than trucks, barges, or saboteurs uh, that you mentioned, and for reasons that I outlined in my opening statement. And we must be able to deny third parties the capability to coerce and deter the United States. And the only way we're going to be able to do that is through missile defense, because the, missile, the, the ICBM or shorter range systems are perfect tools for deterrence and coercion. You don't have to have any intention of ever using them. They're a latent withheld threat. That's the problem. Not that we don't have to worry about the nuclear weapon in the, in the bale of marijuana. I think that's a problem, too. But it's a very different order of problem. What we need to worry about is the withheld threat, and missiles make a wonderful withheld threat for deterrence and coercion purposes. Again, we talked about, does, will they deploy an ICBM? Does it have to be a long-range missile? Let me answer that it doesn't have to be a long-range missile to threaten the United States. Uh, North Korea is willing to sell missiles to anyone with a heartbeat. We know that they're involved in longer-range missiles than the SCUD, uh, in, in, involved in products called the, the SCUD PIP, according to public information, that would be longer range, and they're obviously going to be willing to, willing to sell those to countries that then could threaten the United States. It doesn't have to be an ICBM to threaten the United States. Let me get back again to the point about not worrying about threats from perhaps Brazil or some of these other countries that, that well, might could be I, identified. Before you do that, yes, I know sir. you all get, there's a lot of interchange here of ideas between you all, but I'm trying to kind of tie you down. Yes, sir. The one, one point. Other countries are much more strict in controlling their borders than the United States is. It's not as easy to fly into other countries as it is, as it is into the United States. Does the, the fact of our, our, the laxness of our borders, the ease in which drug smugglers are able to come into this country, is that an indication that the United States may be particularly vulnerable, far more vulnerable than, uh, than other countries, which in fact would reduce the uh, likely effectiveness of, uh, of preventing uh, any kind of nuclear device being exploded in, on U.S. soil? I can only refer to uh, open public statements by the director of the FBI, and that is that... But that's uh, not a very good one. I can tell you right I understand now I'm that, familiar with, that, that with there, his that, work. That, and that is not a, a plausible threat. The, the point is that those kind of threats, the covert sabotage threats that you referred to, don't make for very good deterrence because a deterrent has to be known about to work. You don't deter somebody with a sabotage or a terrorist But that, my point is I'm not interested in deterrence. What I'm interested in is preventing nuclear device from being exploded on the, the soil of the United States. Yes, sir. And, and the point is that uh, if we have a madman out there, whether he's willing to, if he's willing to fire a missile, he certainly is not reluctant about smuggling in a nuclear device in a bale of marijuana or any kind of small aircraft ship or whatever it may be. The point that I'm making is that the United States, the borders of the United States are extremely open. It's very easy. And as I said, we've got drug smugglers that prove it every day. And if you're worried about New York alone, I mean, they have no problem at all about getting heroin in New York City. I can, I can most likely fly it in on airliners. Maybe you can do that with a nuclear device as well. So my point is, you know, given the borders and the openness of this country, does that, uh, in effect, take away any likely effectiveness 
of some kind of SDI system, assuming that we had all the U.S. covered, does this in fact make an SDI system a margin O line? No, the point I was trying to make is that it does not because third world leaders are interested in missiles for deterrence purposes. Is that for show? Is that what you're telling me? What they're telling us, and, and the, the quote I mentioned from Gaddafi, for example, says, we want missiles so that more advanced developed countries will not attack us, and we want to be able to coerce them out of our area. Now, you don't do that with a saboteur's tool. I agree with you that the open borders are a concern. That's a very different issue, and it certainly doesn't uh, it certainly doesn't substitute, fixing that problem, for example, wouldn't substitute for the need for missile defense because what we need to do is prevent third parties from being able to acquire a missile capability to deter us and coerce us. It's a completely separate issue from whether they could smuggle something across the border and detonate it in the United States. Would the gentleman yield? Uh, one last point, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to yield back in time because I've gone too far. I guess the thing, it just as I said, the thing that troubles me and I think the thing that troubles people in my district they don't care how a nuclear device reaches the U.S. soil and ex is exploded, whether it comes in a bale, bale of marijuana or whether it comes in an ICBM. The fact that it gets there and gets exploded, that's what worries them. And the question is, is whether, you know, what is the best way to spend billions and billions and billions of dollars? I would hate to think we'd spend billions and billions and billions of dollars getting a system to deal with missiles and we find out all they do is truck it in on a Cessna. You see my problem? I understand the point. I so I, I hope that we can develop a, a response to that. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your patience. Um, if the uh, gentleman of o from Oklahoma would yield, and I'm not sure whether this microphone is working or not, um, I would like to pursue for just a moment the very excellent line of questioning, because we do not sit here with an unlimited uh, budget with which to grapple with the threats that face our country today. And uh, if we had only $100,000 to spend to meet American threats, how would you evaluate the importance of defending against a uh, terroristic use of a missile as compared with the uh, uh, open borders, which allow a missile to be smuggled in, in a uh, bale of marijuana or in a uh, uh, package of cocaine, they get that stuff in right easily, or is the danger greater to the hearts of our cities from the cocaine itself I or from the marijuana? I think that's precisely the point. Or, During uh, Desert Storm, there were more people uh, murdered on the streets of District of Columbia than were killed by scuds in Tel Aviv. I had to go down to the BBC studio to do an interview that night, and my wife was concerned, you're in more danger walking around the streets of D.C. than those people are in Tel Aviv. Are we we in do have a limited amount of money, and I frankly think that we're clearly running out of money before we're running out of uh, priorities that we need to be uh, fulfilling that are clearly much more important than dealing with these extremely is, unlikely threats. Is the threats. threat to our national security more the uh, inability of American workers to uh, have high-paying jobs that are competitive with those of uh, the competition in Europe and Japan? How do we weigh the, uh, the different threats that we have to uh, grapple with? And in what priority uh, would you uh, put these different threats that have been alluded to today? Dr. Blair. <clears throat> well, um, I certainly would reserve a little slice of the pie for SDI, uh, but it would be uh, committed to research and development. And if I, I, I don't want to belabor this point, but if you can't present me with a material threat to this country in the near future by anyone, then I'm not going to spend the money on deploying a system. But I'm going to hedge my bets for reasons many of the other panelists mentioned, including Mr. Kramer, by continuing a program of research and development. You, uh, you would put some of the $100,000 in research and development for um, uh, countering missiles, is that correct, sir? I, I, I would indeed, and I think that there is a you know, considerable logic to developing a, uh, a defensive doctrine and uh, for, in the long term, trying to replace uh, offensive nuclear threat by defensive nuclear threat. There are a lot of reasons to, to pursue some modest uh, effort in, in the area of research and development. There are no good reasons that I've heard to actually start deploying a ballistic missile defense system. I saw an interesting um, uh, scientific article that the probability of a 
asteroid of greater than one mile in diameter striking the Earth within the next year was greater than the probability of any individual being struck by lightning, <coughs> approximately one in one million. The article said that we had the capability of uh, beginning to track these uh, asteroids that uh, uh, move in our area and that if we had an early detection of them, uh, Oh, one of those asteroids, by the way, would wipe out half of the world's population if it were to impact uh, on the Earth, approximately. Um, is, would, would, uh, how would uh, research on that problem fit with uh, the research on the SDI? I think it would be a much better application of the SDI technology than uh, dealing with some of these hypothetical third world threats. Uh, because, I mean, I attended a workshop uh, that looked at this a couple of months ago and frankly we're faced with a statistical threat that there's a general scientific consensus on that sort of once every century you're going to be hit by something that could wipe out a city the size of Washington or New York. Uh, if you want to put some money into this technology it seems to me that uh, there's a much clearer statistical basis for wanting to spend it on that threat than these totally hypothetical threats that were presented with SDI. Uh, Mr. Kramer. Uh, sir, the, uh, the Maginot line that we have is the anti-ballistic missile treaty and the faith that we will have missile peace in yes, our sir. time. Both of those are extremely easy to circumvent. They have been circumvented. The genie is out of the bottle on missile proliferation, nuclear proliferation, chemical and biological proliferation. And it's easy, by the way, I believe, to pass on biological agents. That doesn't need missiles, but uh, that could be even more effective if mounted on a missile. Uh, and one thing that is good about SDI, I believe, is that it is relatively inexpensive. The proposed project proposal is for $5 billion to $7 billion a year over many years. It is about 2 percent of our uh, defense budget. It is a tiny, tiny fraction of our national product. And I believe that uh, it, for ethical reasons I support SDI as something that will replace the requirement for much offense. It will direct not only us away from, uh, us away from uh, nuclear weapons and b missiles, but away from mutual suicide. And we may even, we will, I believe, save money in switching in that direction, as well as having a much more ethical posture for our deterrence. And I believe that uh, if this is explained in those terms to the American taxpayer, he will wish to invest in our children's future in that sense. And let me also think of a, perhaps an analogy in terms of is it immediately effective against everything? Uh, no, in its first stages you build towards that. If I came to you and said, sir, I have a very promising anti-AIDS uh, medicine, and a critic came and said it isn't going to solve all the AIDS problems, terminate it, or don't accelerate it, or don't deploy it, because it'll only handle one kind of AIDS threat, and we have other preventatives for that particular one, I think you would understand why that would not necessarily be in the interests of those who are threatened by that uh, disease and by the similar scourge of narcotics and by the similar scourge of missiles. Yes, sir. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Zimmerman. Now, if I had your hypothetical $100,000 and that's all we had, I'd probably start by uh, restoring the American economy and the American economic infrastructure, and then I would rebuild, I suppose, at the same time, the American educational system. Somewhere down at the very bottom of the list, I'd put a few few cents here and there for SDI research, though I suspect I would uh, defer on the development of any real hardware. If we're worried uh, about being deterred by missiles, let me point out that there have been many scenarios in novels where that hypothetical smuggled bomb in uh, Congressman English's marijuana bale is brought into the country. Once it's in, all the terrorist or the colonel would have to do is send uh, some of these people with cameras or their bosses uh, a note saying, by the way, here's some credible evidence that we have emplaced a bomb somewhere mm -hmm. uh, in any, either name the city or make it right. harder and more frightening, don't name the city. Mm -hmm. That's just about as good, though not as flashy a deterrent as anything else I can yeah. think of. Thank you. Mr. Hildreth, uh, you've not commented. Do you have a comment on this line of questioning? I couldn't, I couldn't comment on, <laughs> on how you should prioritize your resources, but uh, 
Um, I think when it comes to, except maybe for a federal pay raise. <laughs> 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 but having said that, um, uh, I think it's important when you look at um, it, just talking about SDI, you know, threat and understanding the threat and sifting through all this, I think is, is, is very important. And then what you do with that and once it's understood, then, then priorities can, I think, can be made. I think it doesn't do uh, a, a service to, you know, talk about, uh, you know, something that might happen 20 years from now. Um, I mean, you know, we, we live, it, it, it's hard, it, I think you can do credible analysis out five, ten years. Beyond that, I mean, you know, it's science fiction. You know, and, uh, but I think you need to try and sort, and I think the committee's doing an excellent job of trying to sift through that right now. But then it's, then it's a challenge. I mean, you have to you know, go and you know, think about these things yourselves and sort it out and what, you, what you're going to do. I want to thank each of the witnesses for your responsiveness. Uh, Mr. Kyle, Arizona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, too, have three, uh, three questions I'd like to pose, though not necessarily to all members of the panel, unless, unless they feel constrained to, uh, to comment. Before that, though, I would like to respond to the Chairman's uh, uh, invitation to examine the chart. I noticed that on, on Iraq there is zero capability listed, uh, or a capability with, with a range that almost um, is, is zero. Uh, I think the reason that we sent Patriot missiles over to Saudi Arabia very recently was because we weren't sure. Uh, that's one of the reasons for the teams over there. In fact, I think as we speak there are teams searching for Scud missiles. We know that the range of those missiles is in the um, 650 to 800 kilometer range. So if they have them, uh, that, that yellow or that red bar should be moved out there a ways. And that's part of the problem. We don't know, and because we don't know, we have to be prepared to defend against them. Uh, and 28, uh, the families of 28 Marines can attest to that fact. Uh, my, my three questions are, are these, and they primarily relate to comments that uh, uh, Mr. Blair uh, and Dr. Payne have made all the one regarding Mr. Pike. Uh, Mr. Blair, in your testimony, I have picked up what I, I think is a contradiction, and I want you to clear it up for me, if, if you would, please. Um, <clears throat> starting on page six, uh, you talk about uh, the greatest risk lying at the strategic level. Uh, you say, in, instead, the risk consists of misguided decisions taken by top leaders, which would as likely those are the, the words I want you to focus on, as likely produce a massive strike as a very limited one. And you go on to conclude that, uh, well, let me just read a little bit more because it frames the issue. The greatest contemporary danger of inadvertent nuclear war stems from the high combat readiness of strategic forces coupled with ready reliance on both sides on the option of launch on warning. Uh, add incompetent leadership to the equation, the danger is even greater. If a false warning of Western attack had suddenly occurred at the height of the coup, the risk of inadvertent war might have been significant. We can rejoice in the fact that the West reacted calmly to developments and that the situation was not aggravated by malfunctions in early warning systems. Nevertheless, these are the major sources of inadvertent war. And then you say, and GPALS does nothing to alleviate them. Now, if the risk there of an all-out attack or a significant large launch is as likely as a lesser launch, then doesn't it follow that GPALS is as likely to provide protection against uh, the as likely event, which is that sure, I less your, than I total of the missiles would, would have been launched? Yes, that's, that, uh, that follows directly from uh, the reasoning. I think if you can concede the, the possibility of a misguided decision at the top of the Soviet government or any government, uh, to use nuclear weapons, then they uh, have the choice to decide to use them massively or in a limited way. And in the event that they were to, and, and I can't, can't, by the way, I can't uh, 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 draw this scenario very far, but we're entertaining it for the sake of argument. But if they were uh, then to order the launch of a limited uh, number of strategic weapons, then it's, and the Soviets have designed a system capable to do that, capable of doing that. They have uh, limited options. They have the ability to unlock and launch one or groups of missiles or all of them. If that decision were made, then, uh, uh, then GPALS would be a relevant system. Then the next question is, uh, you know, uh, are there cheaper, more efficient alternatives to, to this problem. Well, if, if arms control, for example, is one of them, I'm not persuaded. But, and I, too, don't think we can carry out the scenario too far. But I think it is important to point out that in a time of, of malfunctioning, which is what would have happened in that event, 
um, it probably would be difficult for them to get all of their uh, launch off as if they were calculating a bolt out of the blue. And, and, and I think it is just as likely that you would have some limited number uh, as you would an all-out attack. And, and in that event, I would conclude that GPALs would, would, uh, uh, would be a benefit. Let, let me go on to the next point. Um, there's been a lot of speculation here. And of necessity, we speculate. That's what providing for defense necessarily entails. But we also have some evidence in front of us, the evidence of the most recently concluded Gulf War. And this goes really to the question that um, Mr. Pike, but, but also others have, have raised, uh, the uh, likelihood that it is, uh, uh, or, or the, the notion that it is more likely that uh, an enemy of ours would use a terrorist kind of weapon than what uh, others have called the ballistic missile, the weapon of choice for a third world uh, enemy of the United States. Uh, the evidence we have is what Iraq did and could do. We have uh, CIA Director Webster's public statements uh, about the, uh, the role of the Western world in thwarting potential terrorist actions by Iraq. But let's play this scenario out a little bit. We're in the middle of the Iraq war. And we know what Saddam Hussein did with some effect. He launched ballistic missiles. Uh, Israeli people and, and cities were harmed. Uh, U.S. Marines were killed. Um, in the middle of that war, he did not steam a, uh, a, a <coughs> fertilizer bomb over to uh, New York. Uh, presumably, uh, he, he could have done so, except that he really couldn't have done so, could he? Um, and I think that's, that's the point. And I'd, I'd like at least to have... Uh, a quick comment by, by a couple of, uh, of you on this point that um, we don't have to speculate about the most recent war. We had a situation where all of the various tools were available to this dictator against us. And uh, we have the evidence as to what he used with, with some effect. Any comment from any of you? And then I have one last comment uh, to Mr. Blair and Mr. Payne. Or question, rather. Well, I'd simply like to remind you of what he did not do. Uh, he did not use chemical weapons. Uh, he certainly did not use chemically tipped. Uh, excuse me. He certainly did not use uh, chemically tipped uh, uh, scuds or modified scuds against uh, Israel or Saudi Arabia. And I think that if you review the record, it's quite clear why he didn't, because there were numerous statements ba made by American officials, particularly Secretary Cheney and Vice President <coughs> Quayle. There were statements made by Prime Minister Thatcher, uh, Foreign Secretary Hurd. Uh, as well as uh, statements by uh, the Israeli Prime Minister and the head of the Israeli nuclear weapons program uh, that in the event that uh, uh, Saddam Hussein did use chemically armed uh, scuds against uh, Israel or other countries that uh, he would uh, face unacceptable consequences. I mean, we've, we've tended to magnify uh, Saddam Hussein into some sort of uh, uh, bogeyman who uh, didn't uh, uh, accord himself with a rational calculation in, uh, in the Gulf War. I think that there were clearly some areas where he miscalculated, but, but I think that it was Mr. equally Pike, clear I, I, I need that to interrupt he was deterred you by this. If you are asserting here before this panel that you know that he had chemical tipped ballistic missiles, in fact, isn't it true, and do you not know that he did not have? Of that weapon. So he couldn't have used it in any event. Well, certainly he declared in his declaration of the United Nations there were 30 uh, chemical scud warheads uh, identified as being uh, part of his inventory. So, so you believe that he had them, but he didn't use them because he would have faced unacceptable consequences, notwithstanding the fact that we disclaimed nuclear uh, weapon use against him. The United States is uh, uh, obviously uh, is very reluctant to specifically say, and uh, Vice President Quayle pointed this out on several occasions, that we weren't going to commit ourselves to precisely the sort of retaliation that we would conduct. But this is uh, the standard sort of nuclear threat that the United States uses, namely a threat that leaves something to chance. Certainly, uh, while he might have been uh, less than totally preoccupied with the threat of American nuclear strikes against uh, his homeland. I don't think that he would have had the same assurances about uh, uh, the Israeli response in that matter. I think that the Israelis have uh, uh, made a number of comments, authoritative Israeli uh, government officials have made a number of comments uh, that in the event of a chemical weapons attack on Israel, the attacking state would uh, face unacceptable consequences. And certainly the um, uh, chief of uh, staff of the Israeli Air Force uh, in a CBS interview, I think the day before uh, 
desert, the commencement of Desert Storm operations made it about as clear as one could possibly make it that in the event that Saddam Hussein used chemical weapons against Israel, that Israel would respond with nuclear weapons. He said that uh, for Iraq to attack Israel with chemical weapons would be suicide for Iraq. Let me sum up what uh, John Pike has said in, in one sentence. Saddam Hussein used none of those weapons and didn't use the fertilizer ship either because he was deterred. It worked. Mr. Carl, I, I think it's important that your committee establish the facts. Uh, I don't know them accurately. I do believe that he may have had the ability to deliver weapons, uh, chemical weapons by air. I'm not so sure about the ballistic missiles. Uh, the Soviets and the Egyptians and the Iraqis in the past in using chemical weapons have delivered them by air and not by by missile, and even if he declared 30, nuclear, uh, 30 warheads with that capability, first of all, I'd like to see whether he had them, because he's been giving us disinformation for a long time. Secondly, whether they had been tested to use Mr. Pike's standard, and, and therefore were worthwhile, in his opinion. And uh, I certainly believe that he was not deterred by the threat of our attacks, and that he proved once and for all that deterrence is a theory which is dead in the hands of tyrants and dictators who may be prepared to commit uh, mutual suicide in engaging a, an adversary. And that's something that is on the horizon. That genie is out of the bottle, and we should draw the proper conclusions from it. Okay. Now, wh what you've heard with regard to Saddam Hussein really is only half the story, and in this case it's a misleading story. And what you've heard is that he was deterred because he did not use chemical weapons. I think the more important point is that he did rain Scud missiles on civilian centers despite the fact that Israel has a credible nuclear threat. In fact, Saddam Hussein's behavior shows how unreliable deterrence is because he's used missiles specifically to escalate a war with a nuclear-armed country, or a, a purportedly nuclear-armed country. That sets our entire understanding of deterrence really on end. So to use this as an example of deterrence working is, is really a very, very far reach and is, is, is not, I think, very plausible. What we know is that Saddam Hussein was not deterred from invading Kuwait. He could not be coerced out of Kuwait. Uh, he told us in statements before the war, uh, for example, if you rain a hundred missiles on me, you won't be able to stop me, even if I can only get one back at you because you will have insulted my pride and I'd rather accept death than insulting my pride. In other words, you're seeing the kind of mindset that the United States is not accustomed to and does not know how to deter. And that carried its, its, its effect throughout the Gulf War. To, su to suggest that the Gulf War and Saddam Hussein's behavior is a, an example of deterrence working, given his actions in raining scuds on civilian centers, is really a, a, a stretch of the imagination. Uh, my, final, uh, my final question, all of the panelists are, are welcome to respond to this, uh, relates to a point that a couple of you have made, and, and I think, Dr. Payne, you were the one who, um, who first raised the point, and that is that um, in the future, uh, ballistic missiles will deter the United States from the conduct or the free conduct of our foreign policy uh, because of the threat that they pose. And it occurred to me that uh, if this is true, uh, it relates not just to the possibility of, a, of an intercontinental ballistic missile attack against the United States, uh, but rather the kind of incident that occurred uh, in Cuba in 1962, which prevented us from using air action against the Cubans uh, to take out missiles because of the possibility of, of a launch by the, by the Cubans or the Russians, um, which requires us to send in Patriot missiles to the Middle East now before we contemplate taking additional action and so forth. Um, I know that the primary uh, question that the uh, chairman posed to all of you was the intercontinental ballistic missile threat to the United States in the near future, and I realize that's the reason for your uh, the thrust of your testimony in that regard. But when we talk about uh, GPALS, the President's program, um, a significant feature of it is to be able to project force and to conduct our foreign policy and be free of the threat of a ballistic missile attack wherever, either to our forces deployed abroad, our allies, or the United States. Now, in this regard, it seems to me not a, 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 a useful exercise to try to differentiate between that which is strategic or long-range and that which is tactical. 
those missiles which are identified as short or medium range uh, in, in the chart that I think Dr. Zimmerman had um, still are, are, uh, uh, include scuds which could be uh, uh, intercepted by, by brilliant pebbles. So you're talking about something which SDI could do something about and I think you're also talking about a threat that's, that is relevant. Take the case of Israel. Um, under the common definition, a tactical missile could be launched from Syria to Israel. It could be launched from the uh, western part of Iraq, but probably not the eastern part of Iraq. And, and I just wonder where you draw the line between tactical and strategic and where you stop protecting. Tactical defense is okay, but not strategic defense. I think that the place that you draw the line is the distinction between uh, nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction. Why, why, why would you draw that distinction, Mr. Pike, when, when the threat posed by a Saddam Hussein with a chemical warhead or even a high explosive warhead <coughs> seems to me to be just as uh, uh, difficult a threat to face when you're talking about protecting a city's population as, as, as nuclear. Because there's a fundamental difference between a high explosive warhead which might endanger a few dozen people versus a nuclear warhead which would endanger hundreds of thousands. There's also a fundamental difference between the type of response uh, that, a, that a conventional attack would call for versus the type of response that a nuclear attack would call for. And there's also a fundamental difference between the performance requirements that you have in dealing with those two types of threats. Well, let me just ask the members of the panel if they agree that there's a fundamental distinction between nuclear and chemical requiring that you defend against the nuclear threat but not against the, uh, the, the chemical threat. And that's essentially the difference between strategic and tactical. Does anybody else on the panel buy that? I'm not sure I said that, but... Well, I, I, then please, <laughs> please correct me if you uh, think I misstated it. May I comment? Sure. Um, the uh, Strategic Defense Initiative Organization briefing that I referenced earlier uh, as something that you should consider putting into your uh, report references scenarios in the Middle East and elsewhere which could, in fact, directly affect our interests, our people, and our allies. And I think it's uh, incredibly careless and callous to try to fence off uh, people um, and areas that would not deserve uh, our protection. Uh, if missiles, for example, just to put it in purely economic terms on one issue, if, if missiles uh, were blackmail, presented a blackmail threat against all the oil fields or any number of oil fields and we had no defense other than go to full-scale war, uh, which is a very bloody thing, uh, go, go on the offense, there's an ethical and diplomatic and political consideration. I'd rather have defenses in place. That's why I want the space base to handle that regional. If we're going to say we don't care that the threat from Baghdad to Tel Aviv is there because it's not our continental United States, I find I'm incredulous about such a fencing off. And uh, we do have forces, people, interests, and allies uh, abroad, and we have just simply got to get out of the self-assurance that the year 2000 and beyond will be the um, missile-free world or uh, peace in our time uh, world that we would like it to be. I hope it is, but it may not be. And if we then rest our faith on the belief that tyrants, uh, whether Husseins or Hitlers, don't act in irrational ways that we might not wish them to, but that they could, then we are really endangering our children. To draw a distinction between uh, chemical weapons and nuclear weapons is obviously appropriate with regard to the laws of physics, but in terms of the type of lethalities that can be inflicted by these two different systems, uh, it's a distinction that the UN will not make. They say that chemical weapons, biological weapons, and nuclear weapons are all weapons of mass destruction. And if you look at, for example, the number of uh, casualties that could result from, for example, 500 pounds of certain types of chemical agents or biological weapons, uh, the, the number of casualties could be catastrophic if they go into the precise area or even in a general area, which is why uh, when you talk about chemical weapons and what that threat might be, all you have to do is remember back to CNN and think about the Israelis sealed up in their rooms with their gas masks. I mean, a number of Israelis died of asphyxiation because they couldn't adjust the gas mask properly. It was a terrible, a terrible loss. Uh, if the United States had to go through a similar type of activity for the five days that Israel had to go through, it could cost the United States up to $90 billion in economic productivity. So it's not just a human loss, but it's a potential economic loss just from chemical weapons. Uh, your point about missile defense constraining the conduct of U.S. foreign policy is absolutely on target. 
Uh, this isn't just an idle academic speculation. We know during the Cuban Missile Crisis, there's quite a bit of a da available data now to, to make this statement, we know from the Cuban Missile Crisis that the political leadership would not engage in airstrikes against Cuba, specifically because there was a rem remote possibility that one of those weapons might be operational and could be launched against the southeastern part of the United States. McNamara named it as one in 50, possibly, a very low probability. But the political leadership I think wisely was not willing to accept that risk and therefore would not engage in the conventional airstrikes that the JCS recommended up until the very end. A perfect example, historical example of how a very mild, uh, modest I guess is the best way to put it, missile threat given the probabilities had a devastating impact and constrained U.S. Uh, military options during a crisis. I concur that uh, the United States would certainly be deterred by nuclear missiles in the hands of a Saddam Hussein or a Fidel Castro. We certainly have historic evidence. But our freedom of action would not be restored and the deterrent effect not removed by the presence of a GPALS. First, it would never have been tested in a thorough operational way. And second, we would always have the uh, Dr. Payne said one in 50, let's take that number, the one in 50 chance that one of those warheads would get through to an American city, that I submit would be a pretty strong constraint on American freedom of action, even with a, uh, a billions upon billions of dollars worth of GPAL system in orbit. Can you draw the line between nuclear, chemical, and all other weapons? Physically, I can draw a line between nuclear, draw two lines, one between nuclear and chemical, one between chemical and all others. Quantitatively, there is still an enormous difference between the number of casualties likely to be inflicted by reasonably plausible chemical warheads and the number of casualties likely to be inflicted by reasonably plausible nuclear warheads. I don't think that the chemical threat is truly great enough uh, to warrant a defense. I don't think that the nuclear threat is great enough and credible enough to warrant a defense which would not in any event restore that freedom of maneuver that you hope to gain. If if there are no other comments, Mr. Chairman, I want to compliment you on uh, holding these hearings. These are enormously important questions uh, to the future of this country. And I think, as several people have said, uh, it's very difficult to project out uh, very far into the future what we're facing. And yet the lead times for these weapons are so long that uh, we really have to be deciding uh, questions that, uh, uh, that we cannot, simply cannot know the answers to. That's why I come down on the side of caution and prudence, and as you know, I'm a very strong advocate of the Strategic Defense Initiative. Well, thank you. I thank you for your compliment. We've tried to hold uh, a panel of balanced witnesses. Your request uh, to have one added, uh, I think, has proved very helpful. <coughs> and we now recognize uh, for his closing questions and, and uh, comments the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Christopher Shays. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank uh, the gentleman here. One of the reasons why I voted to use force uh, to remove Saddam Hussein and his armies from Kuwait uh, was that I wanted to disarm this man and this nation. And um, I, I am someone who has not been supportive of SDI um, and very s skeptical of uh, the Global Protection Against Limited Strike Initiative. I, I, I admit that. I am someone who looks at opportunity costs and says, my gosh, I just don't think we can afford it because we'll take some other things that we need more. But this conversation is intriguing to me because um, I'm not convinced that a deterrent worked. I was, I was led to the feeling that I had, we had, almost every member of Congress had been briefed over a number of years about the accumulation of chemical weapons in, in Iraq and the buildup of the nuclear. We all knew it. And uh, I would say that a number of members voted for the same reason I did, that one man had control over a whole nation. One, one idiot, one man willing to, to call it a, 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 a holy war, 
And I guess what I'd like you to comment is on that fact. I, uh, particularly the, the, those who happen to agree with my view that we may not need SDI. How can we say that he was deterred? How can we say that? He destroyed his nation. He was willing to destroy his nation. Well, because in fact his nation was not destroyed. His population is largely intact. Most of their industrial infrastructure is largely intact. And there's a fundamental difference between the level of destruction that we inflicted on the Iraqi military forces and on selected components of their economic infrastructure on the one hand with the sort of utter annihilation that would have resulted, say, in the event of uh, an Israeli nuclear strike on Iraq. I mean, it's one, it's one thing to argue about the effectiveness of, uh, say, Kuwaiti air defenses, or it's one thing to argue about uh, the level of uh, political resolve of American ground forces. It's very difficult to argue with multi-megaton hydrogen bombs. They're but, extremely conclusive. Their results are extremely unambiguous. Yeah, it's also easy to argue about the terrorist who drives a truck loaded with bombs under a hotel and blows himself up. And, uh, and, and it seemed to me the one thing that was shown in this war was that one man could lead a nation to war. One man could do that. That's the one thing I'm totally convinced about. And that's what scares me the most. But that's uh, I have yes, doubt. One was man that? has always been, or has often been, the, uh, the means of leading a nation to well, war. Well, then I would, I would make the argument that deterrence is, 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 a, is a very weak comfort. Um, because we don't obviously know what's in the mind of the man. I could, I could make an argument to you that, that he, the reason why he was willing to risk uh, a response from, from Israel was that he in fact wanted a response and that he would go out of his way to have a response even at the risk of a, of a nuclear response. Yes, Mr. Pike. Uh, Payne. Yes, Mr. Payne. I mean, to, to say that deterrence worked in the Gulf War is just an absolute stretch of the imagination. Saddam Hussein did not believe our conventional threats. That's why we had to engage in a conventional war. If he had believed our conventional deterrent, he wouldn't have done that. We wouldn't have had to engage in the use of force. He wouldn't have gone in because he believed our threat. He went in and he stayed there because he did not believe our conventional threats, and he clearly didn't believe in our nuclear threats. Well, had he believed our conventional threat, that might have been a deterrent. But had, had he believed it, it might have been a deterrent, and he might have either stayed out or, not, or, or pulled out once he was there. The point is that deterrence often fails despite the existence of large arsenals, which Mr. Pike pointed to, because foreign leaders don't behave, we would behave the way we would like them to believe or the way we, we predict them that they're likely to behave. They don't behave in the ways that we expect because they don't believe the kind of threats that we make, they don't understand the kind of threats that we make, or we just don't communicate the threats very well. <laughs> that's, why, that's why deterrence often fails. Let me, let me just uh, get into another area, because this, this will probably be more helpful for my appreciating where I need to go. I, I have not supported SDI. I have, I have supported uh, research, but not deployment. Uh, the grand strategy under SDI, when we had a hearing earlier, Mr. Chairman, where, they, where we were talking that the cost was between uh, $75 billion and $150 billion, and we didn't quite know how the system would work, we didn't know what our mission was, left me very skeptical. Uh, now I I'm, I'm, I'm almost feel that the global protection against limited strike is a recognition that SDI really would not have worked and would have been a mistake to move forward. So it, it, what, what is to make me feel comfortable with the global protection against limited strike? I have yet to find anyone in my own district, and I represent the 4th Congressional Dick District in Connecticut that has IBM executives, some of the best minds. I have yet to find one constituent who is a, a serious engineer or technician who says we can make the system work. And so that's one of my problems. But my biggest problem is the opportunity cost. Um, Mr. Kramer, you made a response that, that on the face of it can be very compelling. I don't, I don't want to ever have to say I'm sorry. Well, I was thinking of, of using that same logic. What do I say to people who believe in global warming? I don't really know if it's a threat. If I wait to find out if it's a threat, it's going to be too late. So do I all of a sudden spend masses of resources so that I don't have to say I'm sorry? I could make that argument to so many different constituents. Bottom line is, people up here have to make a choice. In other words, some of you are specialists in your area. You don't have to decide between this and another, and that's why I'm not going to ask our gentleman from, from Congressional Research, because what I'm, my question is, is the choice. This is good compared to what, o what other defensive programs would you eliminate so we can do SDI? Because this is a fact. 
The fact is we have capped our expenditures for defense for the next five years. We know that we have certain strategic weapons that will have to be eliminated. And what weapons should be eliminated so that we can continue to fund SDI? B2 is less important than SDI. Um, give me some other programs that you would knock out so we, don't, so we can fund SDI. I guess basically I'm asking just, the proponents. Just very briefly, uh, the first part of your comments, you distinguished, which is almost never done, between the logical and the psychological. Our experts tend to talk about the logical import of deterrence and forget that human beings can be quite psychologically uh, different from their logical expectations, and sure. Saddam Hussein has demonstrated that, as has history in the past. Also, that deterrence based exclusively on threat, as distinguished from the capability to defend against um, the, the abuse of, uh, uh, the, the mind's abuse of that warning that, that they would be hit by offense, that is, if deterrence breaks down, th that, that leaves you in a, in a box. If you threaten a wild person or a wild animal, I, you know, I, I hear you. Wildly. Let's get to the next yes. issue, though. So, okay. Uh, I guess really, you, I'm just you need asking. the option for defense. I'm asking the two uh, proponents, yes. basically, of GoPals, to, to tell me what you'll eliminate in the defense budget, because we have to make choices. What goes so we keep this? I believe that as you bring in SDI in, in stages, you can certainly downplay offensive investment and should do so. And uh, I think those choices can and should be made. Uh, if I personally had to choose between SDI and B2, it's, it's no contest. I would certainly choose uh, SDI uh, for many reasons, if you're asking me that specific choice. What other programs would you eliminate, though? That wouldn't cover all the cost. What Five or seven billion a year? No, it wouldn't cover all the costs. Uh, I mean, we, we have already committed more no. cost in our defense budget than, than is under the budget agreement. So uh, we have to eliminate. What else would you I'll, eliminate? I'll be happy to think about that more for the record uh, and, and to do it informally okay. as well, if you would like. No, if you could give me something in writing yes. for, for this yes, committee, because will. the bottom line, and this is the whole point, if we could afford everything, I might say, yes, SDI makes sense or GoPals makes sense. We can't. What would you eliminate, Mr. Payne? Well, for example, we're going to be withdrawing probably on the order of 200,000 troops from Western Europe uh, over the next 10 years. Uh, that's at least the figure that Chancellor Cole has No, suggested. but that's already in there. That's already going to be done. I mean, we're going to be re making those reductions. What that's in the budget now would you eliminate? Um, let me go back, because I think that withdrawing the forces and dismantling units, as opposed to just having them redeployed to the United States in some cases, uh, and doing that in general with forward deployed forces is going to save an awful lot of money because the, the bulk of U.S. defense spending goes for conventional forces, not for s nuclear forces, not for defensive forces. Let me ask you, we, we already have in the budget a reduction of 25 percent personnel. Would you reduce that number further than 25 percent? Yeah, I probably would. Okay. So, but in order to keep cheap house, what else would we, what else would we, um, what else would you eliminate? That won't cover it. Well, I suppose it depends on how far down you're willing to go below the 20, 25 percent before you know no, whether just, it's so going to cover only, or not. So your, your way would be to, to, to just do the conventional, we'd be more dependent on the strategic? No, I mean, I, I agree with, the, with Sven Kramer that if we move, as we move into a new relationship with the Soviet Union, we have less need for offensive retaliatory threats, and so some of the savings can come from the offensive forces. I think that some savings can come from conventional forces as we disengage from our forward, de forward deployed positions, which we're going to do anyway. Uh, so I think that there is enough savings. And what we're talking about is roughly 2% two two of the defense budget for a relatively short period, which is why if I had Congressman Thornton's $100,000 and that represented all U.S. government spending, I'd be quite happy to accept well, you know, a minuscule fraction no, of that no, to pay no, for No, it. what we're talking about uh, is about a program that's going to cost tens and tens of billions of dollars. We don't, it, its mission isn't quite defined. We don't even know if it's going to work. And the bottom line for me, and I'll conclude this way, Mr. Chairman, is we have a $300 billion deficit this year in our budget. We're going to have a $400 billion deficit next year in our budget. This is our country. Our interest payments on the national debt this year are greater than all social domestic spending. The interest on the national debt is greater than running the judicial branch, the legislative branch, the executive branch, and all the programs and services the executive branch provides. And the problem for us that's not a problem for you is that we've got to make the choices. And with all due respect, um, I would have thought there would have been a number of programs you could tell me we could eliminate from defense, because I'll conclude. Defense is still $100 billion more than all our social domestic spending. So, you know, it, it's, we've got to make the cuts there if we're going to keep SDI or GPALs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Well, I want to uh, I want to thank the gentleman from Connecticut because uh, we have uh, the request for a hundred and twenty billion dollars more over the next several years for SDI, of which twenty four billion has already been consumed. So you you do express a congressional viewpoint that may be at variance with uh, technical experts who do not have to look at an a, a entire budget situation that we're constantly faced with. And I thank the gentleman uh, for his uh, usually stimulating questions. I, I would now like to uh, uh, introduce uh, John Spratt of South Carolina uh, a friend of the chairman and uh, a member of the Armed Services Committee uh, with whom we frequently find ourselves working and uh, note that he is with the committee today and ask if he has any inquiries that he would like to put to our panel before we conclude. Mr. Chairman, I would just put uh, one general inquiry and I am at the disadvantage of not having heard the whole testimony, although I know some of the members of the panel and have read uh, the thoughts of others. Would the panel respond to this proposition that this government, the United States, is likely to continue spending substantial sums on strategic defense? That's a political fact. You need to start with that as a likely given. We can't wipe the slate clean and assume nothing will be spent at all. And if these sums running into the billions are going to be spent each year, does it not make sense in this year, the eighth year of SDI, to have some sort of orienting principle, some sort of focal point, such as the deployment of a ground-based system for the money, the billions we're spending, number one. Number two, does strategic defense is, is it not on a continuum with theater missile defense, which is a threat that I think most of you would acknowledge needs to be addressed, so that money is spent on developing particularly ground-based interceptors and the command and control and radar systems necessary to conduct ground-based ballistic missile, theater ballistic missile defense has some commonality. The money spent developing GBI and even EEI uh, will teach us things we need to know and can valuably apply to theater missile defense. And then finally, if we develop this strategic defense system, ground-based, treaty compliant, within the framework of the ABM treaty, clarifying any ambiguities is necessary, say, to permit the GSTS to be deployed through the Standing Consultative Commission, would we not then be able to use this system to make a practical assessment of strategic defense? We would have an operating system with some utility, with some commonality, with other useful military systems, and we would able then to be able to test its potential to see whether or not we could have a more complete and extensive strategic defense system that would protect us against threats from China and residual threats from the Soviet Union. Is that logic attractive to, to any members of the panel? No. In uh, the first point, I, I guess that I would um, have to differ with your counsel of despair in terms of the Congress's uh, attitude towards how much we're going to be spending on SDI. I mean, what you basically seem to be uh, telling me is that the Congress is unable, that the Congress recognizes how foolish SDI is, but nonetheless, for political reasons, is unable to refrain from spending this money. And no, since I we're going I to be say that. I'm spending saying, it, we might as well have something to show for it. I'm, I'm giving you a hypothetical, political hypothetical, which is pretty real. I mean, there are enough folks around here to uh, continue the spending because there's enough perception of a threat that. Uh, most members of the Congress are not willing to totally strangle this program. I haven't been, although I've been consistently in favor of reducing expenditures on it. Well, I think that we could spend significantly less money than we're spending on it now and nonetheless continue to have the sort of robust program that we had prior to the advent of SDI, one that has a very clear focus of maintaining technological leadership and avoiding technological surprise. I don't think that we have to have a commitment to deploy something 
in order to have the sort of cast along shadow program in SDI that many people are advocating we ought to be having in other programs. Uh, but in the absence of uh, a, a, a clearly defined reason for deploying it, uh, to say that we ought to deploy it simply because we're uh, going to spend the money anyway and we might as well get something out of it doesn't seem to me to be very useful. In terms of the question of what the relationship is between theater missile defense and strategic defense, I guess that I was very struck uh, at the time of Desert Storm that uh, Army Missile Command, uh, having managed to get a couple of hundred million dollars out of the budget and actually come up with something useful, whereas Strategic Defense Command and Strategic Defense Initiative Organization, eight years and twenty billion dollars later, didn't have anything uh, that was worth deploying. That would say to me that rather than combining the strategic and theater defense programs, that we ought to be keeping them separate and bet on a winner. But and I would Clark, certainly be concerned. Strategic Missile Command, if, if SDIO had been engaged in developing and perfecting a ground-based interceptor and an endo-atmospheric interceptor, then possibly we would have had in Desert Storm a theater missile defense system that had a broader footprint of coverage, area coverage, and the ability to intercept uh, incoming uh, missiles farther out, higher up. Which is certainly Patriot. something we could have done with Patriot Pac-3. I mean, my, my concern is that, that, by, that by, you know, trying to draw these two programs closer together rather than uh, maintaining the sort of separation that we've traditionally had with them, that we're basically allowing the theater missile defense mission, one for which there, I think that there's a broader political consensus than there is for the strategic mission, mission that we're basically allowing the theater defense mission to become a stalking horse for the full-blown Star Wars program. And Ambassador Cooper has made it very clear that he thinks that theater missile defense is going to be the first place that we're going to run into the ABM treaty. I would be very reluctant to see a situation in which some passing fascination for theater, theater missile defense was allowed to become uh, the source of the demise of an ABM treaty, which has served us very well for a long time. So I would keep those missions separate, and I would focus on uh, the tactical program on defining the minimum necessary requirements to do the mission rather than the maximum possible performance that one could attribute to the theater defense mission in order to, to undermine the ABM treaty, which is, I think, the direction that Ambassador Cooper is going. Mr. Pike's uh, comment on uh, winners and that the uh, SDIO didn't produce any uh, winners is perhaps slightly disingenuous and unfair in that SDIO was never charged with developing launchable, usable hardware on a time scale that would have gotten it there by 1980, from, from 1983 to 1990, 1991. But uh, let me say that I'm not keen on focal points for the money and getting something to show for it. Uh, if there is merit in the long-term strategic defense initiative and the long-term budget for strategic defense, it is precisely in those tech, in, it is precisely in exploring those technologies which we do not yet understand. If one wants to call them Star Wars and, and Darth Vader, so be it. But they have in the uh, out decade or even further on, they have some potential to be globally useful against serious threats. And if you want to continue spending money on strategic defense research, I would urge you to put it on those, I would urge you to put it into those technologies which are less well understood and for which even a graduate student or an undergraduate in physics cannot, on the back of an envelope, uh, devise quite adequate countermeasures such as sticking the warhead inside a multi-layer uh, aluminized mylar balloon. Uh, as to compliance systems and making logical decisions, I, I did suggest earlier that a system at Grand Forks could be used in that way if it were tested under what I called earlier truly realistic conditions. My suspicion is that if those realistic tests were carried out, however, that we would find in short order that systems didn't really work very well against intercontinental range threats and that we probably would do to 
such a system what we did in 1976, and that is take it down in a hurry. Well, I want to thank you uh, on behalf of the subcommittee. Uh, I can't begin to express the uh, appreciation for all of you uh, joining us here today. Uh, we've asked for a, a quick turnaround on uh, this uh, uh, raw uh, transcript. Uh, there is an incredible amount of information to be drawn. We appreciate that there was a, a, a very excellent media coverage of your statements, and particularly the questions back and forth. Uh, I must say that we, uh, we are skeptical that, that there is a threat. Uh, we are uh, unsure of whether there is a reason to prioritize uh, the, in addition, the excess of $100 billion that the Strategic Defense Initiative might require. Uh, we are doubtful of a third world country uh, intervention, and it seems to me that there is some indication that there are credible means of, of deterring uh, future ICBM threats in the United States. And I don't mean to be dispositive of this subject. It continues on. But, but your presence here and this hearing, which coincided uh, in such a timely fashion with the President's very important statement of last Friday, uh, makes us very, very grateful for all the work that you've put into the hearing. Uh, the subcommittee stands adjourned. C-SPAN, the cable satellite public affairs network, and its companion network, C-SPAN 2, are privately funded to serve the public by America's cable time.